Everyone thinks he is a weak, pathetic loser, but he is actually the most powerful man in the universe. Wang Ling is a high school student who possesses an extraordinary amount of magical energy, which he tries to keep hidden from others. Even as a child, his power was so immense that he fearlessly confronted and defeated a monstrous giant frog. However, this remarkable feat remained unnoticed and the credit was mistakenly given to someone else. When he was born, he crawled out of his mother's womb himself, and his dad fainted when he saw that his newborn son had a bigger package than him. Just from that, his parents knew that he was the chosen one, and they decided to spend all their resources grooming him into the strongest warrior. However, the young Wang realized that the best thing for his mental health was to keep a low profile, and he always hid his true ability from everyone, especially his parents. On the first day of his new high school year, Wang enters the campus and notices the statue of Zhu Yi, who was renowned as the man who saved Huaxiu. As he makes his way inside, two senior students noticing his low force value, which is a number representing one's prowess in the realm of spiritual abilities, decide to bully him and ask for money. Their bullying, however, is abruptly interrupted by a golden beam of fire. A girl flies down from the sky, declaring that it is unfair to bully a freshman with a low force value, and the girl is none other than Sun Rong, the daughter of the legendary Flower Fruit Water Curtain Group. Everyone admires her, while the seniors, intimidated by her reputation, quickly retreat, claiming that boys shouldn't fight with girls. She approaches Wang and assures him that she will protect him no matter what, and they shake hands, but to everyone's surprise, he hands her the $10 that the bullies demanded from him, leaving everyone very confused, including some girl, as she thought her night rate was higher than that. Later, Zhu appears in a hologram form and asks the students to gather for a spiritual force test to determine their class placement, and the students with excellent scores would be placed in class elite, while others would be in the ordinary class. As the test begins, the first student, Xuan, finds himself in a dark room with water on the floor when suddenly, a giant frog appears and the water begins to glow. The students watch the scene unfold on a large display from outside. Sun Girl recognizes the frog as the one that attacked the city many years ago and was defeated by Master Zhuo. But after learning that girls kiss frogs to find a prince, he apparently decided to come back what a simp. It is revealed by the announcer that the real giant frog is sealed under the campus, and the one they are facing now is merely an incarnation of its spiritual force. The students are instructed to summon their own spiritual force and strike the frog's head, however, many students fail to even touch the barrier. Then, a boy named Chen Chao enters the scene, confidently hitting the frog's barrier with his hand, which glows with fire and is selected for class elite along with Ku Hao, who has an impressive force value of 886. Sun Girl then joins the contest, striking the frog with a force value of 2019, and the crowd hails her as a goddess. As Wang's turn arrives, he catches the frog's attention, which senses his power and recalls their encounter from years ago. The frog contemplates that if he were to attack, its soul and spirit would be in jeopardy. Wang, in order to maintain his average facade, pretends to struggle, exerting minimal force while feigning maximum effort. Just as he is about to strike, the display screen malfunctions, showing an upside-down image of the frog. To everyone's surprise, Wang's force value is displayed as 99,999 on the screen. The crowd is stunned, and Sun Girl realizes that there was no protective membrane around the giant frog this time. He ponders why the frog reacted that way when he hadn't actually struck it, and realizes that it was playing dead. He secures his place in class elite, and the classroom settles down as Pan, the instructor, begins the first summoning lesson. Pan explains that the space around them is filled with spiritual entities, and they must utilize their spiritual force to create a passage in the space and summon a spiritual creature. She further explains that the size and strength of the summoned spiritual entity depend on their force level. The students make their attempts at summoning, with Chen summoning a stick that elicits laughter from the others. Well, I suppose he wanted to branch out with his summoning skills. Meanwhile, Sun Girl successfully summoned a skeletal dog with a cute pink bow tied to its tail and playfully calls it a stray dog. As she observes her creation, she can't help but wonder how much spiritual force is really required to summon a genuine spiritual beast. When it is Wang's turn to summon, a blast occurs in the classroom, and he unexpectedly summons the giant frog from the test, triggering panic among the students. The instructor Pan swiftly intervenes, merging Sun Girl's stray dog with a giant frog, resulting in an odd-looking green-colored dog. The students are filled with awe at the new creation and lovingly name it Froggy 2. The next day arrives, and as Wang makes his way to school, a flood of memories from his childhood washes over him, reminding him of the reasons why he has always strived to maintain a low profile. 
He reflects on the extraordinary events that seem to unfold around him and remembers how he discovered that his touch alone proved to be a force to be reckoned with, shattering a prized limited edition dragon slaughtering sword that his parents have lovingly bought for him. Although he knew that his mother had actually purchased a counterfeit sword to prevent his father from wasting half of his hard-earned money. The extraordinary incidents continued to occur as he grew older and on one unforgettable birthday, he inadvertently set the entire house ablaze while attempting to blow out the candles atop his cake. Forget nursery rhymes, this guy was busy shattering swords and setting houses ablaze even as a kid. Nevertheless, when his parents witnessed him defeating the giant fraud of level 5 at the age of 6, they decided that Wai needed to lead an ordinary and happy life. They provided him with a protective amulet to wear on his back neck and a golden pill to be taken daily in order to suppress his power. Despite these measures, he remained strong and his father promised to create a new amulet that will be more effective in concealing his power. Until then, Wine resolved to attend school and maintain the lowest possible profile, blending in seamlessly with the rest of the students around him. Upon reaching school, he finds Chen and Sun Rong locked in a fierce competition to become the class president. Wang reaches school soon and he finds Chen and Sun Rong locked in a fierce competition to become the class president. Sun Rong wails out her daddy's money in an attempt to sway voters by offering them free items from the canteen. Chen and his friend Gu criticize her for cheating. However, she views it as an opportunity to showcase her talents and charm. Nobody accepts the free gifts but Wang, who is driven by his insatiable craving for free crispy noodles. He accepts her freebies and promises to vote for her and the rest of the sheep will follow him. She can manages to win over Chen and Guo, but that is just prep work. Her real trick is using her special ability called Art of Seduction, which makes anyone indebted to her unable to oppose her. Everyone is marked by the forbidden raised jutsu except for Wang, who left the scene the moment he got his noodles and gave her bodyguard a golden pill to give to Sunron as a repayment. Later, in the classroom, the fat teacher Kang notices the mark over all the students and he starts a lecture on the ancient art of spiritual seduction. He says that it works when someone takes a gift from the spellcaster, who uses hand seals and a spell to make everyone into their fans. Wang has also realized that the teacher is targeting Sun Rong, but thankfully, he returned her favor through the golden pill, so he is safe from her charms. He keeps staring at her and Sun Rong thinks he is interested in him. Wang signs that the noodles he got from her were delicious, but she misinterprets him and thinks he is asking her to eat the golden pill he gave her. Sun Rong obliges, thinking that she might get a spiritual power boost with the pill, but it turns out to be a medicine to nerf spiritual power. Sun Rong loses her spiritual powers and suddenly, everyone is released from her seduction spell. Kang calls her out to try chanting the seduction spell, but she is still feeling dizzy from earlier and collapses as she gets up. Luckily, Wang saves her, and then the teacher asks him to chant the seduction spell, which is super effective on Sun Rong. After that, the election for the position of class president is held fairly, and Chen wins it. The next day, on his way to the pill refining class, Wang meets Sun Rong, who walks on a red carpet with full VIP treatment. He notices a magical sign on top of her head and realizes that he had inadvertently used the seduction spell on her. He approaches her and gently touches her hair before dispelling the sign to free her of the seduction. However, Bro has so much riz that even doing that made Sun Rong fall harder for him. After that, their instructor, Pan, explains the intricate process of creating a vitality pill using an earthen pot and a furnace. After she is done explaining the steps faster than Eminem, the students discreetly size up each other's furnace for the task. Chen has brought a copper cauldron that belonged to his great-grandfather, while Sun Rong has brought an industrial furnace from her dad's factory. Wang has brought a microwave, but Gu has brought the most sophisticated portable furnace available on the market. After Chen overloads his cauldron with coal and blasts it, he runs away and Pan tells everyone to set an alarm for seven hours after they place the pot in the furnace. Everyone leaves the class, but Froggy sneaks in because he can sense the energy coming from Gu's furnace, and he wants to snack on it. Luckily, Wang anticipated Froggy's actions, and he returned to the classroom in time. Froggy still swallows the furnace and runs away from Wan, only to get caught and forced to vomit. Wang then decides to wash it, but Gu misunderstands the situation when he sees him coming out of the toilet with his furnace. Fueled by confusion and suspicion, Gu confronts him and aims his water pistol at him. Wang explains the truth, but Gu does not trust him and pulls the trigger, shooting poison out of his gun. Wang dodges it, but accidentally Chen was right behind him and he was so exhausted from running that he couldn't stop the poison from entering his mouth. Chen collapses and Gu panics because he's in grave danger because of the poison. Wang is about to heal him, but Gu stops him without knowing what he was doing. They take Chen to the classroom and Gu tells Wang that he will forget about him stealing his furnace if he can help him create pills to save Chen's life. 
Wang decides to play along and assists Gu in refining the pill. But as the plus-size boy is panicking that they might not make it in time, Froggy attempts to snack on the furnace once again. Reacting quickly, Gu uses a spell that causes Froggy to emit spiritual energy before being flung away. Gu is astonished that the heating process of the furnace seems to have gotten faster, and they run a few experiments using Froggy's power before he confesses that he can manipulate the flow of time with his spiritual ability. Using his abilities, Gu and Wang speed up the pill refining process. They feed a pill to Chen to help him recover, but then they hear the sound of the instructor and other students coming back to the classroom. Gu leaves to stall them for time, but he isn't much help and Miss Pan barges into the class. To his surprise, everything appears normal and on top of that, Pan retrieves a golden pill from his furnace and gives him a full score in her class. She then goes to Wang and finds that his pill is broken and charred, and she scolds him for doing a poor job. Gu is moved because he thinks that Wang gave his golden pill to him and pledges his undying loyalty to him. Little did he know that Wang did no such thing, and he never removed the vitality pill from his furnace, so it got prepared along with the antidote pills, while Wang's microwave had obviously failed in its task of pill creation. While all this happens, Chen sleeps peacefully in the cauldron where Wang threw him, and after class, they take him out. They even manage to fix his broken cauldron with the help of Froggy's time manipulation abilities, and Chen broke into tears as he hugged and thanked Wang. The next day, Sun Rong approaches Wang in the break period, asking him on a date and leaving him speechless. Just then, he notices two assassins wearing rabbit masks on a nearby roof, aiming a sniper rifle at her. Acting swiftly, Wang uses his powers to redirect the bullet, saving Sun Rong's life. Unaware of the danger she was in, she continues to plead with Wang to go on a date with her. But just then, Kang enters the classroom and asks for Wang to follow. He takes this chance to get away from the simp, but she mistakenly believes that he said yes to her and keeps following him. The story about their budding romance becomes the talk of the school, and even the assassins takes note of it. Meanwhile, Kang introduces Wang to the joint director of the school league master Zhu Yi and leaves them to discuss something in private. Zhu immediately recognizes him as the boy who defeated the giant frog and gets on his knees to pay respect to Wang. He asks him to take him as a disciple, but Wang is really bothered just by thinking about it, and he uses his special skill of forgetfulness to erase Zhu's memories about the event. The next day, Wang has a nightmare about Sun Rong forcing him to go on a date with her. But as he wakes up and takes a look outside his window, he finds that his nightmare is about to turn into reality. Startled, he quickly closes the curtain and heads downstairs to have breakfast. To his horror, his parents are thrilled about the prospect of him dating Sun Rong, and they urge him to live his life to the fullest. They proudly show him the high-end nutrition pills that Sun Rong gave them and virtually sell their son to a young sugar mommy. He gets into Sun Rong's car reluctantly and secretly wishes that the assassins from before show up now. She informs him that they are heading to an amusement park called Heavenly Paradise, which happens to be her family's real estate project that her grandfather built exclusively for her. Inside the park, they visit a giant statue face, which is said to predict the future of the relationship between those who put their hand in its mouth. Sun Rong, believing in the legend, convinces Wang to try it. However, just as they approach the statue's mouth, he notices the two assassins who had been following them here. One assassin quickly draws his guns and fires, but Wang manages to catch the bullet in his mouth and spit it back at him to send him flying. Sun Rong misunderstands his reaction and thinks he was smiling at her, so he wipes out her memory and that of the guide. Wang and Sun Rong continue their date, enjoying various rides and games, with Wang ensuring their safety by thwarting any further attempts by the assassins. He also uses his forgetting trick whenever necessary to erase these incidents from their memory. At sunset, Sun Rong asks him if they could ride the Ferris wheel together and watch the fireworks. Wang agrees, thinking that he might find a moment of peace there, but he is proven wrong as the assassins follow them. While they enjoy the beautiful spectacle, the assassins suddenly sneak up on them and hold them at gunpoint. Sun Rong suspects that the assassins are from the underworld organization called Shadow Faction and positions herself between the assassins and Wang, determined to protect him. Seeing this, Wang becomes furious, and just with his gaze, he disables the guns and phones of the assassins. He then throws them out of the ferris wheel without even touching them and hits them with a powerful fire spell, ending them without a trace among the fireworks in the sky. Wang then asks Sun Rong to keep everything that happened a secret, and she promises him to do that. For the first time in his life, instead of taking away someone's memories, Wang relied on a promise to keep a secret, and then he got back to admiring the fireworks show with Sun Rong. The following day at school, the atmosphere is tense as Gu and Chen eagerly ask Wang about his date with Sun Rong. Sun Rong arrives in her limo, accompanied by her vigilant bodyguards, and joins the conversation. 
Her bodyguards form a protective circle around them as the Kang informs them about the ongoing threat from the shadow faction assassins who tried to attack her yesterday, and thus their security has been amplified. Sun Rong claims that she didn't see any assassins, and just then Zhu arrives and claims that he took them out before they could do anything. Yesterday, after Sun Rong returned home, Wang used his partial forgetting trick on Zhu to make him remember himself as the hero who stopped the assassins. Zhu then informs everyone that a shadow kill order has been placed on Sun Rong and soon, many strong assassins will come after her. He explains the heightened security measures implemented to protect Sun Rong, such as armored soldiers at the gate and various levels of security within the building. Zhu instructs everyone to gather in his office, which is equipped with a powerful protective force field. Additionally, he mentions that the special forces will patrol the area with their magical flying swords to prevent distant sniper or aerial attacks. However, the assassins bypass all their security measures, and the first one sneaks into the school building through an underground tunnel. The man is the number three assassin of the Hammer team, and he uses a toy hammer to knock out all the ordinary guards stationed around the school. Zhu and Kang notice him before he breaks the surveillance camera with his chicken hammer. They immediately start changing their strategy and assure the students that they won't be harmed by the assassins, but the students don't pay them any attention. They are too busy scrolling TikTok and chatting about the date between Wang and Sun Rong yesterday. Meanwhile, another assassin, the second member of the Hammer team, has entered the building too. He takes out a bunch of elite bodyguards using poison gas and heads towards Zhu's office only to be taken by surprise when Kang attacks him. Zhu and the students watch the battle unfold on a screen from inside the office. Meanwhile, Wang finds himself craving crispy noodles and places an order while watching the fight between assassin number two and Kang. Kang successfully avoids the assassin's traps and crushes his spiked hammers with ease. Just as the assassin tries to make his escape using a poison gas burst, Wang knocks him out by simply opening the door in his face. He immediately apologizes and goes to pick up his food delivery, while Zhu reassures the worried Sun Rong that he will be alright. On his way to receive his order, Wang encounters the leader of the hammer team, who is hiding using his power of invisibility and gathering energy into his massive hammer. He remarks that he found him, but while the assassin panics, it turns out that Wang meant that for his order of crispy noodles. Assassin number one is relieved that he wasn't seen, but Wang clarifies that he can see even John Cena, so he's nothing special. Realizing that Wang can see through his invisibility spell, the assassin decides to abandon the mission to deal with him immediately. He releases all the energy he has gathered and swings his fully charged hammer at Wang, but it lands on him like an egg on a rock, and Wang is completely unscathed. He continues to eat his crispy noodles casually as the assassin falls to his knees, terrified of Wang's spiritual energy. Wang drags the assassin along with him and Zhu comes running to his side, once again addressing him as his master. He uses the same old partial forgetting trick on him, making him believe that he was the one who defeated the assassin. The assassins are apprehended by the police, and everyone gathers around Zhu to praise him for his bravery, but they notice Wang in his arms, who seems to have been injured. Wang pretends to be sick after school and takes sick leave, remaining at home for 10 days. Sun Rong was so worried when he pretended to be sick that she set up a world-class medical pod to take care of him, and he spends all his time lying inside it. His mother shouts at him, urging him to stop pretending and return to the school now. She brings breakfast and asks him to come out of the pod and eat. Just then, his dad shouts from downstairs that his friends have come to see him. Poor Wang becomes terrified and quickly runs back to the cabin, pretending to be sick, while his mother greets his friends who have brought flowers and gifts. Wang's mother kindly tells them it is not necessary and goes downstairs to prepare snacks. Gu teases Wang for still being sick and introduces his pet bird, Birdie Two, which perches on Wang's healing cabin and repeatedly mocks him. Everyone laughs, except for Wang, who silently curses the ugly bird. Suddenly, Sun Rong suddenly remembers that they left Froggy at the door, but Froggy comes in with Wang's mom, who goes straight to Wang and starts licking his face. She thanks everyone for taking care of her son at school, and Sun Rong sees this as an opportunity to build a relationship with her future mother-in-law. She gives Mrs. Wang some elixirs along with some nutrition pills that she claims will boost Wang's recovery. She also presents an injection containing a chicken blood tonic for his full recovery. Wang's mother is sold just with these gifts, and she leaves, telling her son to treat his friends, especially Sun Rong, well. Sun Rong pushes Froggy away and sits down next to Wang. She asks him if he's feeling better as she takes out the chicken blood tonic injection and tells him that it is said to work miracles for recovery. Wang is terrified upon hearing this, and Chen comes to his rescue as he informs him that Kang gave wristbands to test the spiritual power of every student in their school, which is in Faction 60. He has brought Wang's wristband to allow him to test his spiritual power. 
But Sun Rong gets angry at this and argues that the spiritual test will require a lot of energy, and Wang does not have to take it if he is not feeling very well. To avoid Sun Rong and her chicken blood tonic, Wang runs to Chen and grabs the wristband from him, announcing that he has recovered and can therefore test his spiritual powers. After that, Chen demonstrates that one should concentrate all their spiritual force into a sphere so the wristband can measure the spiritual force. Chen's force power value comes to around 600 and Gul remarks that this value is not much different from the entrance test. He explains that this represents force outside the body, which is achieved by concentrating one's spiritual power and visualizing it externally. It requires persistent training and signifies the ability to manifest spiritual power in any shape, making one a true cultivator. Gu then takes his turn and his spiritual power value only reaches 176, leaving him feeling ashamed. He attempts to jump out of Wang's window in embarrassment, but Chen saves him. Sun Rong then suggests that she should probably skip the test to avoid causing any damage to the bracelet. However, Gu and Chen point out that she only scored 2019 points in the entrance test, so her sphere shouldn't be big enough to do any damage. Sun Rong reluctantly agrees and takes the test, and to everyone's surprise, her spiritual power nearly blows away the room and she scores a remarkable 4015. Her performance places her second on the list of the top 10 high school cultivators in China, behind only Tang Jing's from their rival, Faction 59 School. Now is Wang's turn to take the test. As he wears the wristband, he considers leaking his spiritual force to score low on the test. Initially, he creates a small sphere, thinking it will suffice, but even in that is too strong and everyone in the room is literally struggling to stay grounded. Wang quickly redirects his spiritual force to outer space, creating a gigantic spiritual force sphere larger than the Earth itself. Everyone wonders where his spiritual sphere went and he receives a score of null. That just means that his power was greater than what the bracelet could measure, and he takes the top spot among all the high school cultivators. His friends wonder how he can be placed on top with a null score, and Wang suggests that it might be a display error. Everyone leaves for home, and Wang hears Gu talking about hacking into the school system to alter his score. He gets a brilliant idea and calls Gu for help at night so that he can hack into the system to alter his score to 175. Gu agrees to assist him and starts hacking the system, using a complex spell to predict the password. Surprisingly, the password turns out to be just eight asterisk symbols. Gu spots Tang Jing's name in second place and replaces it with the name Birdie 2, because they had some history in the Cultivator Cram School. However, as Gu tampers with the system's coding, an alarm is triggered and he quickly quits before he can change Wang's score, leaving him disappointed. Little did they know at that time that Tang Jing's and his friend from the 59th faction were also hacking into the system at that moment, and they are not happy that Gu followed their attempt by triggering the alarm. Tang is furious at finding his name changed, and he wants to teach a lesson to the students from the Faction 60 school, as he suspects them behind it. The next day, Wang is back at school having lunch with his close friend when the news program on the TV attracts their attention. The news was broadcasting the training session of Faction 59 students, who were preparing for the National Senior Sword Competition that was going to be held soon. The reporter emphasizes that the students' abilities are on par with professional standards and highlights Tang Jing's performance as he dodges hundreds of sword projections with ease. The reporter interviews Tang, asking him about their preparations against their rival, Faction 60. He confidently mentions that his teammates have undergone rigorous training for a month and they won't lose. The reporter then asks him if he has any messages for Faction 60. He acknowledges Sun Rong's immense power and expresses his eagerness to face her. However, when questioned about Wang, who was placed on top, his frustration becomes apparent and he sarcastically wishes Wang the best of luck before abruptly concluding the interview. Later that night, Wang and his friends are at their homes, unwinding after a long day. Suddenly, they receive an unexpected invitation to a chatting group from Kang, where he reveals that the five of them are participants in the upcoming National Sword competition. Shockingly, they discover that Froggy, their loyal canine companion, has been included as the fifth. It turns out that Froggy took the spiritual force test and scored an impressive 5,000, surpassing even Tang and earning the right to participate. This was a plan that Kang and Zhu hatched in secret to win the tournament at all costs. Miss Pan was initially against it, but Zhu convinced her since there is a precedent for spiritual beasts participating in the competition. Ken shares the good news with his father, who is overwhelmingly proud of him and presents him with a special spiritual sword that was forged at his birth. Gu then eagerly shares details about his own cherished sword, which he has possessed for nearly eight years. The blade was forged using the teeth of a formidable spiritual beast, but he has not been able to unlock its sword spirit yet. 
Sun Ron joins the conversation through a video call and showcases her spiritual sword, Ocean. Kang is immediately shocked by the sword's blue color and realizes that Sun Ron has produced a sword spirit. It takes time and effort to foster a genuine connection with the sword to manifest its sword spirit, and the instructors in the group praise Sun Ron for that. She then astounds everyone by flexing her generational wealth and revealing that her family has forged 13 more swords similar to Ocean, just in case one breaks. Kang then explains the process of producing a spiritual sword spirit. Initially, the sword spirit is in a chaotic state, but with dedicated effort, it solidifies and takes the form of a small beast or a human. With time and training, it evolves and upgrades, gradually developing intelligence, and some sword spirits, possessed by exceptional cultivators, even have the ability to think. Kang assures them that they will learn more about this in higher-level classes and encourages them to cultivate a strong bond with their spiritual swords. As the conversation progresses, Froggy becomes the center of attention, and the group playfully teases him, wondering how a dog could possess a spiritual sword. To their astonishment, Froggy surprises them all by sending a video of himself pulling out a spiritual sword called Sword of Sky from inside his body, and then swallowing it whole. After that, all eyes are on Wang and his friends eagerly inquire if he too possesses a spiritual sword. After he peacefully finishes his crispy noodle packet, he gives them a simple yes as his answer to end the conversation. No one seems to notice that Wang doesn't want to take part in the competition. He is concerned that if he shows his true power at the competition, it will be the end of life on Earth. However, his friend and his instructor take the competition very seriously, leaving him with no option. He goes downstairs to ask his parents about his sword, but finds his parents watching TV, or Zhu and his team are cracking down on the Shadow Faction's headquarters after their assassination attempts on Sun Rong. Wang then takes his parents' attention away from the TV and asks them the whereabouts of his spiritual sword. He then goes to the attic in search of his sword and finally finds the box containing it, which starts glowing in Wang's presence. From inside the box, a boy with white hair appears, exclaiming that it has been 10 years. Startled, Wang quickly closes the box and feels a sharp pain from his amulet. The next day, Wang gathers with his friends outside the school gate. Chen and Gu will make fun of his tiny wooden sword and throw some double-meaning jokes in the conversation. Sun Rong, however, finds it cute and Froggy is the only one who realizes the immense power of Wang's sword. Kang, Zhuo, and Miss Pan arrive and inform the group that the competition will take place in Faction 59 for five days, requiring them to stay there. Upon seeing that Wang has brought no luggage, Kang asks him if he will be fine without his stuff, unaware of the fact that Wang intends to fake a stomach ache and return home before the competition starts. Everyone except Zhu boards the bus as he has some emergencies he must take care of. His team has captured the boss of the Shadow Faction. But it turns out that he was catfished by a suicide bombing robot, while the real boss is following Sun Ron to finish her for good. Inside the bus, Wang's sword spirit, Jink, tries to emerge, but he suppresses him and reminds him of their agreement from the previous day. He had given the sword spirit crispy noodles in exchange for remaining silent. The bus soon arrives at the gate of Faction 59, where they are welcomed by Tang Jing's three other students and their instructor, Si. Pan and Si glare at each other with intense hatred and jealousy. They used to be close friends once, but now they are rivals who constantly insult and mock each other. They get into a quarrel over the abilities of their students, but Wang is irritated because he can't find an opportunity to fake a stomach ache. To get back at Pan, she goes to Wang and uses her grand testing trick on him. A ray of spiritual force passes through him, and he figures out that he could use this to his advantage. He seizes this opportunity and pretends to collapse on the ground while clutching his chest. Everyone from Faction 60 gathers around him to check if he's okay. Unexpectedly, his sword spirit emerges and tells Wan that his amulet is breaking. As he realizes this, he asks the sword spirit why it didn't tell him earlier, to which it replies that it tried to inform him about it on the bus, but Wan kept shoving it back inside. The amulet then shatters, releasing an unimaginable amount of spiritual force into the sky. Everyone is terrified and suspects C of doing something to harm him. She, however, denies any involvement and says that Wan must be on the soccer team because he knows how to act so well. This angers Sun, and she shouts at Si to have a look at Wang and questions how she can call it acting when he is in such a critical condition. While it was not as Wang planned, everything is going his way till now, but he realizes that if his power is not subdued soon, a disaster could occur. Wang is carefully placed on a stretcher by the medical team, and Sun Rong rushes to be by his side. When Tang stops her and talks about the time they went to the cultivation cram school together, she asks him to leave her alone. However, he is a douchebag who doesn't care about her feelings and boasts about his current position as the chairman of Faction 59's student union. Irritated by him, Sun Rong tries to throw a punch, 
but is unfortunately stopped by a short girl with white hair. Tang then introduces her as Yisha Bai, the student union secretary. Ken, concerned for Sun Rong's well-being, goes to her rescue but is stopped by Tang's lackeys. Meanwhile, Wang's body is engulfed in a blazing purple fire and Structric C ties him up using bandages like a mummy to put it out. Tang knows that the culprit behind that is the fifth member of their team, but he jokes that Wang's spiritual power seems to be very volatile and explosive. Sun Rong is furious that he is trying to harm Wang on purpose, so she draws her sword and charges at Tang, only to be stopped by Kang, who tells her to hold her rage till the competition starts. In the medical room, Wang escapes from the doctors and begins searching for a way to sneak out of Faction 59. He knows that his amulet is at its limit, and if he uses his spiritual power a few more times, the world will be done for. Wang calls his dad, who is busy dropping a banger in the toilet, but as he learns about his son's dilemma, he rides out to meet him without even wiping his ass. Meanwhile, other students assemble in the gym to receive instructions from Ms. Chi regarding the next day's competition. She explains that the competition will be like a domination match on Call of Duty. There are five altars on the field, namely metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. Inserting your sword into an altar accumulates your score, and the first team to reach 100% wins. Tang then proceeds to mock Faction 60, pointing out that they only have four members with Wang currently sick and suggesting they should give up. Go retorts back, saying that Faction 59 also has only four members. Tang responds with a menacing laugh, claiming that their fifth member has been there all along. Suddenly, a massive wave nearly crashes into Faction 60, and a gangster wannabe called Bifong comes out of it. He is the fifth member of Faction 59, but he immediately proceeds to flirt with Sun Rom and offers to join her side if she accepts his flower. Seeing her in trouble, Chen rushes her defense, but Bifeng uses a barrier and sends him flying away. Bifeng once again asks Sun Rong to accept his flower, but Chen returns to attack him again. Bifeng simply flicks him away before overwhelming him with great speed and hitting him with a powerful combo move. However, Chen is not the one to give up. He remembers his dad's words about fighting all kinds of injustice in the world and releases all his energy as he goes in for a punch. Bifeng simply catches his arm and annihilates it using his negative spiritual energy before tossing him away. Just then, Wang enters the gym thinking he found the exit and catches Chen, who comes flying toward him. As soon as Wang catches him, his arm is restored to normal, shocking everyone. As Kang explains to Pan that Bifeng uses negative spiritual energy that can destroy matter when it comes into contact with positive spiritual energy, Froggy wants to tell him that if Wang's amulet breaks, his negative energy will destroy the whole galaxy. Just then, Wang gets a call from his father, asking him to come and get his amulet, but he hangs up on him, knowing that he won't be able to sneak away right now. Bifeng wonders how the boy could have repaired Chen's hand in an instant, realizing that he might be more powerful than he appears. Bifeng suddenly throws a punch filled with negative spiritual energy at his face to test his power. Surprisingly, Wang calmly takes the blow and takes almost no damage. Bifeng is utterly shocked, realizing that he seems to possess no spiritual force at all. Otherwise, his head would have been destroyed. Wang, devoid of any emotions, simply walks away and as Sun Rong comes to ask if he is alright, he gives her the rose he just stole from Bifeng. Everyone is then instructed to leave their respective preparation rooms. However, Wang excuses himself, saying that he wants to get the limited edition, sweet potato-flavored crispy noodles. No one is aware that Lu Ying, the boss of the Shadow Faction, has disguised herself as a student of Faction 59, and she is stalking Wang. Bifeng finds her and realizes that she is actually a MILF who is pretending to be a teenager. He asks her to date him, but when she refuses, he makes the mistake of calling her an old hag. That doesn't sit well with her, and she punches him away. Bifeng gets up, laughing menacingly as he calls her a worthy opponent. However, she soon shows him the difference in their levels as she neutralizes his sphere of negative spiritual energy in an instant. Bifeng gets his ass beat, but luckily, Wang stumbles upon him as he is about to finish for good. Luying smirks as she sees him and immediately decides to change her target. She then ties both Wang and Bifeng with her dark spiritual chains, rendering them unable to escape. She drags them to the rooftop, where she hands them over to her old driver. She then proceeds to kick Wang with her heels, thinking he is Sun Rong's loser boyfriend. However, she is oblivious to the fact that his amulet is on the verge of breaking. The seal on Wang's power is almost gone, and as Luying stomps on him while insulting him, his emotions create a storm. Wang's sword spirit desperately tries to get him back to normal to prevent him from accidentally releasing his spiritual energy, but no amount of shouting wakes him up. Finally, when he says that crispy noodles will be available for half the price today, Wang gets a grip over himself, causing Jink to let out a sigh of relief. 
Lillian then disguises herself as Bifong using voodoo and proceeds to join the meeting of the students regarding the competition. She suddenly bursts open the door and announces that Wang has been kidnapped to force Sunrong to take rash actions. Zhu Yi, who joined them anticipating that the enemy might plan something like this, asks if the kidnapper is a pretty blonde woman. By doing this, he not only confirms that the woman is Jiang Luying, the leader of the Shadow Faction, but also rises her up. Tang then asks Yisha to use her calculations, and she reveals that there is some strange spiritual force on the old campus. Sensing the imminent danger, Sun Rong's guards prepare to take her away to ensure her safety. However, she beats them down and declares that her family never backs down from a fight. She says that Wang is her most important friend, and she will save him at all costs. The rest of Faction 60 joins her, along with her bodyguards. Ms. Ji sends her students as well, but advises them not to participate in the fight as their primary objective is to assess their opponent's battle skills. Meanwhile, Wang Ling sleeps peacefully, because now he doesn't have to worry about finding a way to avoid the competition. However, his peaceful slumber is interrupted when the driver announces that it's time to do his job, and Bi Feng starts crying for help. Annoyed, the driver kicks him and sends him to the floor below them, causing the entire building to tremble. Jink informs Wang that the old man has a very strong spiritual force, but he doesn't want to show it. Sun Rong and the rest of the group arrive at the scene and see Wang tied up on a pole. The bodyguards get on their flying swords and head to the rooftop. The driver launches an attack using his spiritual power and takes them out while calmly sipping his tea, saying that young people nowadays have worse aim than stormtroopers. After dealing with the first batch, the driver unleashes his special attack and summons soldiers made of golden spiritual energy to destroy his enemies. Sun Rong instructs her bodyguards to keep their heads low and takes on the army alone. She summons all her ocean swords and surprisingly manages to hold off the driver for a little while. However, the driver's power is overwhelming and Sun Rong begins to lose the fight and falls rapidly to the ground. Just when things seem dire, Wang Ling intervenes by using his time manipulation ability to rewind back to the moment when the driver sent Bi Feng through the roof. The incidents that happened till now are rewritten almost as if everything happened within a Takeuchi's Jinjutsu. Wang defeats the driver and uses his forgetting trick on Zhou, making him take credit for defeating the old man. The driver is then bound with the spiritual chain and everyone is shocked to see Zhou there. Zhu tells the press that all hostages were rescued and that the old man is suspected to be a member of the Shadow Faction. The special forces investigate the building and one of them asks Wang if the hole was a result of the battle, but he replies that it was already there when he was brought here. As soon as the special forces squad member leaves, his sword spirit, Jink, emerges from the hole and asks him what to do with Bi Feng, who is lying unconscious inside. Wang instructs Jink to keep an eye on him and not let him out, thinking that if Bi Feng doesn't participate, the competition will be cancelled. However, little did he know that Lu Ying, disguised as Bi Feng, would be in the competition. So the next day, to his dismay, Wang is forced to take part in the competition that he desperately wanted to avoid, wondering how Bi Feng is here. The students are given special Bluetooth earphones to communicate with their teammates, they are also told not to fly above 5 meters from the ground, and that the battle area is covered with a special restoring field, so that they won't take any real damage because of the competition. The competition is about to begin, and the participants then place their hands on a magic crystal that teleports them into the battle zone. Just then, Wang's father comes running to give the amulet to Wang, but it is too late as he enters the battle zone. Upon seeing his master's father, Zhao excitedly approaches him. Wang's dad trusts Zhou and tells him about his son's predicament and the amulet breaking, leaving him shocked. Faction 59 hacks into the system and everyone except Bi Feng enters the competition in the same place. Meanwhile, all the Faction 60 members are scattered. Yisha uses her Neuralink enhancements to find out the locations of the Faction 60 members, but is unable to find Wang's location due to his low force value. Chen is at the West Altar of Metal, Sun Rong at the North Altar of Water, Froggy at the South Altar of Fire, and Bi Feng is also there. Considering everyone else's location, Tang predicts that Wang must have landed at the East Altar of Wood. As soon as this was said, a member of Faction 59 with orange hair ran to Wang's location, thinking that he was the easiest prey. Meanwhile, Gu finds himself in the same location as Faction 59 and he is shitting bricks, fearing that they will find him. His cover is blown when Tang attacks, but cleverly, Gu has left a decoy in his place. Tang falls for the trick and stabs the decoy, while Gu sneaks away. He is concerned that he only has two of his paper dolls left as decoys, and the competition has only just begun. However, he has noticed the ginger guy going after Wang, and he decides to follow him and take him down. Faction 59 then disperses to fight Faction 60, and succeeds in capturing the Altar of Earth. Upon hearing this announcement, Chen becomes concerned and rushes to capture the metal altar. 
However, he is unexpectedly hit by the sharp leaves of the strange metal tree, which leaves scratches all over his body. Despite this, Chen pushes himself forward, but upon reaching the altar, he wonders how to capture it. Just then, Yusha appears behind him. Chen says it is beneath him to fight women, and he offers her to attack him three times to make it even. However, he is left puzzled when she claims to be done within a few seconds, but nothing has happened. He thinks she is mocking him, but suddenly he loses control of his body and starts hitting himself. This was Yisha's technique that released a spider web, which messed with the target's nervous system and made them her puppets. At the altar of fire, Froggy and Bifung engage in a heated battle. As they exchange punches, Froggy absorbs Bifung's negative energy, using it to empower itself. However, despite absorbing the negative energy, Froggy is ultimately defeated by Bifung, who then successfully captures the altar of fire. Meanwhile, at the altar of wood, the ginger guy arrives and finds Wang lying unconscious on the ground. Considering himself lucky, he moves towards the altar with the intention of capturing it. However, Wan regains consciousness soon, and just as Ginger is about to attack him, Gu intervenes and strikes him with his special ability that lets him spit bars, quite literally. They engage in a serious battle while Wang simply watches them, devoid of any emotions. At the same time, Sun Rong is about to capture the altar of water when she is suddenly attacked by Tang. They engage in a fierce battle, each ruling their powerful sword spirits. Tang's ice spirit is an equal match against Sun Rong's water spirit, and neither of them seems to have the upper hand. Suddenly, an announcement is made that Faction 59 has successfully captured four altars. In an attempt to turn the tide, Sun Rong tries to use her special move called the Ocean Dance Technique, but Tang quickly counters it by freezing the lake they are standing on to get the elemental advantage. Sun Rong still rushes at him with full speed, but Tang's sword spirit is able to hold her back on his own. They exchange blows while flaunting their swordsmanship skills, but then Bifeng joins the fight at Tang's request. Now facing two formidable opponents, Sun Rong worries about how she can escape their clutches. Suddenly, they hear the ginger guy screaming as he flies across the sky like a rocket. Moments later, a powerful wind sweeps the entire battle zone and shatters the ice, miraculously providing Sun Rong with the opportunity to escape. Tang remarks that this is a huge negative energy, even stronger than Bifeng's, and decides to leave to investigate its source after he captures the Altar of Water. Upon capturing the fifth altar, Faction 59 gains a speed bonus, but then another announcement is made, stating that Faction 60 has now captured the Altar of Wood, leaving everyone surprised. Through Sun Rong's earphone, who informs her that Wang and Froggy have joined forces to capture the altar. A few minutes earlier, Ginger and Guo were engaged in a fierce battle. Guo utilized his mouth can ability to spit bars and send powerful bursts of words at his opponent, but he couldn't repeat them too frequently. He ran out of words soon, leaving him momentarily defenseless. Ginger mocked him before insulting Wang and kicking him. At this moment, Froggy entered the scene to devour the spiritual energy that would be released during the fight. However, upon seeing Wang, he quickly concealed himself. Ku suddenly got an idea, but he knew it would come at the expense of his friendship with Wang. He apologized to Wang in advance and proceeded to release a diss track on him at the spot, sending powerful words at the Ginger. Hearing Wu talk badly about him, Wang felt intense emotions for the first time in a long while. His amulet not only suppressed his spiritual power but also his emotions, making him naturally cold and emotionless. Now that it was on the verge of breaking, he was trying his best to suppress his emotions so that he didn't trigger his powers. Because of his strong emotions, Wang started releasing a huge amount of negative energy. Seeing this, Froggy jumped at him to consume the negative energy and save the world. Wang suddenly came up with a strategy. He decided to use Froggy to consume the excess negative energy, so that he could use his spiritual energy. Wang fused with Froggy to create an unholy mixture of man and beast. Go was amazed by this and asked him if it's a trick. But the ginger simply mocked Wang and said that even after all this, he is still just unrecyclable trash. Undeterred, Wang walked up to him and casually touched his sword, which was enough to shatter it. Wang then effortlessly nudged the ginger guy sideways, causing him to soar through the air like Team Rocket. And that's how he captured the Wood Altar and disabled the Faction 59 speed boost. After hearing the announcement, Tang starts to panic and asks Yisha how this is possible. She tells him that Wang combined his spiritual force with Froggy, and he has become unstoppable now. Soon after that, Wang, along with Guo, gained control of the Fire Altar, leaving Tang furious. He instructs Bifeng to head to the Earth Altar and tell the other members of Faction 59 their new strategy to avoid fighting Wan while rotating their positions to have the majority of altars under their control. Wan then goes to the Altar of Metal and wakes up Chen. 
Upon awakening, Chen is startled to see Wang's appearance and immediately searches for Yisha, claiming that she cheated him. Wang then captures the Altar of Metal, gaining the upper hand against Faction 59. Seeing Chen excited about this victory, Wang smiles, leaving his friend surprised as he had not seen him display any emotions before. However, Tang outplays them and captures the rest of the altars, leaving the score a 1-4 with Faction 59 leading again. Wang realizes Tang's strategy and although he is very powerful, he can't claim the altars alone one by one. So he tries to increase his speed, but Froggy warns him that he's reaching his limit and asks Wang to stop, otherwise the world will be doomed. Thankfully, he's interrupted by Sun Rong, who contacts everyone, informing them that she is with Guo and they are about to take the Altar of Fire. She mentions that they have one distinctive advantage, which is Wang Ling, and this causes him to blush. Sun Rong asks him to capture the Earth Altar, which is guarded by the strongest faction 59 member Bi Feng and Chen should safeguard the metal altar they have already captured. Wang realizes that Chen is now the most important person in their strategy, and their victory depends on him. Meanwhile, she and Guo go to the fire altar, using water to conceal their movements from Yisha. Upon reaching the altar, Gu starts teasing Ginger 2 from Faction 59, distracting him while Sun Rong sneaks inside to capture the altar. Tang figures out her plan and immediately tells Ginger 2 to get back to the altar and prevent Sun Rong from capturing it. He hurries to the altar to stop Sun Rong, so Gu uses his can of words to attack him. However, Ginger 2 trips on a rock and falls, and the attack accidentally hits Sun Rong, pushing her away from the altar and giving Tang enough time to come there. Sun Rong remembers the rivalry between their families and how she and Tang have been at war ever since they were kids to protect their family's honor. Tang shouts at Ginger 2 to hurry up and reclaim the sword, while Gu apologizes for missing the first time and aims again at him. He managed to hit him, but it was not strong enough to stop him. Sun Rong throws one of her swords at the altar and starts fighting Ginger 2 with her other swords. However, the countdown doesn't start since it requires the participant to insert the sword themselves. Realizing this, Sun Rong goes to the altar to reinsert the sword herself, but suddenly Tang's sword spirit intervenes and breaks her sword. Tang then mocks her for losing her opportunity to claim the altar and tells her that although he planned on winning with an overwhelming 5 to none, he is still happy to win 4 to 1. He taunts them about the dire situation Faction 60 is in, and his strategy becomes clear to Sun Rong, who realizes that they must capture the fire altar or else they will lose. She knows that Tang is only watching out for Wang and he has set Yisha after him to capture his altar in case he leaves to capture another one. So Sun Rong tells Gu that they have to do everything possible to stop them from claiming this altar, and Chen must do the same to prevent Bi Feng from capturing the metal altar. Meanwhile, Bi Feng arrives at the metal altar and starts fighting Chen. Chen is eager for their rematch, but he recalls Sun Rong's words and dodges Bi Feng's attacks instead of fighting back, as all he has to do is keep the enemy from inserting his sword into the altar. He does a pretty good job at avoiding the attacks and realizing this, Luian, who is pretending to be Bi Feng, taunts him, calling him a coward. Upon hearing her taunting words, Chen recalls his bitter childhood and how his father would call him a coward and beat him up if he didn't perform to his standard. Despite the rush of emotions, Chen controls his feelings and continues dodging Bi Feng's attacks, infuriating him. Just then, a sharp leaf falls from the tree above the altar and Bi Feng realizes why it's called the Metal Altar. So he gathers all the falling metal leaves using his spiritual energy and throws them at Chen, injuring him badly. But despite this, he tries to stop Bi Feng, further enraging him and getting his arms annihilated by his negative energy as a result. Meanwhile, at the fire altar, Sun Rong realizes that Chen is in danger and asks Gu to leave and help him. Gu hesitates and says that she can't go against Tang and the other guy alone, but she insists on him leaving. Gu moves away from them and hides, secretly charging his sword, while Sun Rong fights Tang's sword spirit alone. Suddenly, a phoenix emerges from Gu's sword, which is his sword spirit. It is extremely powerful but requires the sacrifices of other sword spirits, so Sun Rong and Gu had planned this previously. She sacrificed her sword spirit, which helped in manifesting Gu's phoenix spirit, and together they unleash a huge fire blast at Tang and Ginger 2, defeating them. Back at the metal altar, Chen is severely injured but continues trying to stop Bi Feng, who kicks him several times before going to the altar to insert his sword. Chen attempts to get up, but he can't and starts crying, thinking that he will let his friends down at this rate. However, just as Bi Feng inserts his sword in the altar, Chen's secret ability, which only comes out when he wants to protect something precious, suddenly manifests. He awakens with golden, spiritual energy-infused arms and blasts away Bi Feng, stopping the countdown. Chen then reclaims the metal altar by throwing away Bi Feng's sword and inserting his own. This leads Faction 60 to a 3 to 1 lead, and then Wang captures the Altar of Wood, furthering their lead to 4 to 1. 
However, Luying has had enough of pretending to be a stinky and edgy teenager, and she tears away her disguise and reveals her true self to destroy everyone. During the strategy session earlier, Sun Rong had suggested that even if she and Gu take the fire altar and Chen Chao keeps the metal altar, they will still be unable to catch up with Faction 59's progress. Therefore, in order to secure victory, they must use their secret weapon, Wang Ling. Using the chaotic battles on the altar of fire and metal, they plan to distract Yisha. At that moment, Froggy and Wang unlink their spiritual connection, allowing Wang to reach the earth altar without alerting Yisha due to his low force value. Everything goes according to Sun Rong's plan and Yisha is shocked that they are losing the competition. More than the fact that Tang was defeated, she is wondering who could have reached the wood altar since Wang is still at the water altar. Suddenly, Froggy decides to reveal his identity, which startles Yisha. She tries to control Froggy with her spider web, but it doesn't work on him because it only works for humans and not spiritual beasts. Also, the web gave away Yisha's location to Froggy, who leaps on her and intimidates her with his horrible form. Meanwhile, Gu tells Sun Rong to go check on Wang at the Earth Altar, while he goes to the Metal Altar and joins Chen. She agrees and leaves to join Wang Ling. Although they currently have more altars, they are still lagging in the progress bar of a Faction 59 still having the better chances of victory. While all this is happening at the arena, Wang's dad, who is in the control room with the Faction 59 and Faction 60 staff, wonders how his son is doing. Since he was a child, Wang has grown accustomed to ignoring both success and failure, as his amulet suppressed all his emotions. He never let his emotions get the better of him until he met Sun Rong for the first time, and his heart skipped a beat. From then on, he started experiencing emotions little by little, and the more friends he made, the softer his heart became. Right now, his emotions are about to be let loose as he goes to capture the Earth Altar. He trembles with emotion, thinking about how happy his friends will be when they win. He is unable to keep his sword steady at the altar, and his amulet starts breaking again. The more he tries to restrain his emotions, the more they intensify, causing a surge of negative energy to break from him. However, Sun Rong joins him and holds his hand, and her touch and kind words help Wang get a grip. Together, they capture the Altar of Earth, securing victory in the competition. Sun Rong compliments Wang Ling's blushing face and encourages him to be himself. Amidst their flirting, Lu Ying, who arrived here after defeating Chen, stabs Sun Rong to death. Her soul leaves her body and Wang Ling is heartbroken as she vanishes from his embrace. He cries out in fury, and his amulet, which has held on for so long, finally breaks, and the world starts to collapse under the overwhelming pressure of his spiritual energy. Froggy runs to Wang to stop his spiritual energy from leaking and to prevent the world from being doomed, but he is still furious and proceeds to attack the Luying. So Froggy freezes the flow of time, but Wang breaks free from it and continues to attack Luying, causing her to unfreeze as well. Seeing his true power, Lu Ying taunts him, mocking that he was unable to protect Sun Rong in the end. She attacks him, but it is all just fancy acrobatics to him, and he sends her flying with just one punch. His rage is uncontrollable now, and he intensifies his attack to knock her out. Wang does not stop at that and uses his spiritual power to send giant rocks flying at her, which then causes a huge explosion around Lu Ying. He is about to deliver the final blow, but suddenly stops short of killing her. Even with Lu Ying begging him to finish her, he decides to spare her as he recalls his memories with Sun Rong. He goes to Sun Rong's body and cradles her. He tries to use his ultimate repairing spell to restore her, but it doesn't work. Froggy tells him that Lu Ying hit her with such hatred that Sun Rong's spirit was torn apart, and even Wang can't save her. Despite this, he notices that she is still warm and breathing. Froggy explains that it's because he has stopped the flow of time that Sun Rong is still alive, but if time starts moving again, she will be gone permanently. Wang cries helplessly and tells Froggy that there has to be another way to save her. He realizes how lonely his life will be without her and declares that he will use all his spiritual energy to save her. Froggy warns that doing so will destroy the world, but Wang insists that he will restart the world again. Wang Ling has already used the solution to all the tech problems and turned the earth off and on four times and each time he hoped that everything would be restored to its original state including Sun Rong being alive. However, no matter how many times he resets the world, Sun Rong remains dead. Jake joins him and tells him that Sun Rong's spirit has been broken into pieces, and no one can save a life that is already gone. Despite this, Wan proceeds to restart the world again, but Froggy tells him that the result will be the same no matter how many times he tries. Wang cries out of desperation and regrets not finishing Lu Ying sooner, as then Sun Rong would still be alive with him. Froggy explains that now that he has stopped the flow of time, they can take their time to figure something out. Wang gets an idea and asks Froggy 
they would be able to go back in time if they moved faster than light. Froggy agrees, but he warns that it would require a tremendous amount of spiritual force. Wang tells him that he can do it, and Froggy cautions him that this goes against the law of nature. However, Wang is determined to save Sun Rong, and Froggy decides to be the best wingman and risks everything, so that they both can go back in time. Suddenly, Wang finds himself back on his first day of high school, when the seniors start bullying him. This time, Chen and Gu protect him from the bullies, not Sun Rong. He even handed over the $10 to them, wondering why he just did that. Sun Rong is not in the classroom either, and Wang can't remember her, but every time when Sun Rong was supposed to be there, he feels intense emotion, even though he doesn't understand why. Everywhere he goes, he feels like someone is missing, and he has moments of deja vu. The new world seems to be just the same, but without her. The reality is that when Wang and Froggy combine their powers, space and time converge and release such a large amount of spiritual force that they ended up creating the new world without Sun Rong. This new world constantly absorbs everything from the old world, except her, which will eventually lead to the old world's destruction. As time passes, it seems that no one from the old world can stop this from happening. However, just when it appears that nothing can prevent the destruction, Sun Rong's soul enters the underworld. The ruler of the underworld is shocked to hear her name because she has the same surname as her master. She checks the database and finds that Sun Rong is indeed the descendant of her master and the former ruler of the underworld. What is more, she realizes that her boyfriend is so upset with her death that his actions are threatening to destroy the world. She immediately sends Sun Rong back to her body, and as she gets up, she finds Wang's sword spirit there. She asks him what is happening and who he is, and Jink gives her the reaction like he just saw Gear 5 Luffy. Meanwhile, in the new world, Wang and his class visit the amusement park. At the fortune-telling statue, Zhao is their guide and everyone tries their luck, but Wang feels something amiss and decides to test his fortune. To everyone's surprise, the statue breaks. As they continue through the various rides and games, Wang Ling suffers from deja vu. Chen and Gu notice that he has been acting strangely, and Wang tells them that he feels as though he has been here with someone special before. They remind him that they are there to have fun, and they tell him not to worry too much. They all go to ride the Ferris wheel together, where Wang Ling finally breaks down, realizing someone important isn't there. Meanwhile, in the old world, Sun Rong learns everything that happened from Wang's sword spirit, and he tells her that if they don't wake Wang up, this world will soon be destroyed. The only way to do that is for her to take his sword and destroy his new world. Sun Rong wields the sword and rushes towards the parallel universe containing Wang. She dodges the self-defense mechanism of the universe and manages to create a cut in it, through which she attacks Wang and destroys the border between the two worlds. As soon as she does this, her memories come flooding back to Wang, and his friends tell him to go to his world, where his girl is waiting for him. Through the crack between the dimensions, Sun Rong pulls Wang out and they are reunited. This time, Wang turns back time and goes to the moment when Chen captured the Altar of Metal. Lu Ying reveals herself and tries to attack him, but before she can do anything, Wang squats her down and buries her in the ground from far away. With this, Sun Rong remains safe, and they win the competition too. However, Sun Rong does not remember anything that happened before this point. She comes running to celebrate their victory with Wang, but as the reporters swarm her, Froggy asks Wang if he is satisfied with what just happened. Wang recalls the events that unfolded as they were in the distorted world, and he realized that his grand repairing spell had no effect because the world was too chaotic. Froggy told him that there was one way to save the world, and for that, they would have to reverse the timeline. However, it would come at the cost of Sun Rong losing her memories of what Wang did for her. Sun Rong assures Wang that even if she doesn't remember them saving each other, her feelings will still bring her back to him. With that, they reset the time and saved everything. As Wang watches over his friends celebrating their victory, his dad comes there with a new amulet. Froggy warns him that his feelings will be subdued once he puts them on, and his relationship with Sun Rong will turn cold too. However, upon seeing Sun Rong and everyone else happy about their victory, Wang opts to put on the new amulet, hoping for world peace. As his dad puts the new amulet on his neck, Froggy warns Wang to never do anything so reckless in the future. Because he destroyed and restarted the world over and over again, his spiritual force has been greatly reduced and Wang sighs, complaining that maintaining world peace is a hassle. As a result of Wang using too much spiritual energy, the entire world is a mess. All the technology that runs on spiritual energy is affected and the people don't understand what is happening. Also, events like the National Sword Competition that consume too much spiritual energy needlessly have been suspended. The schools reopen after summer vacation and everyone at Faction 60 is happy and content that their team made it to the top 10, 
But the participants are not satisfied because they had a solid chance to win the competition if it went on. Wang has become oddly quiet and distant ever since they won against Faction 59 and Sun Ron is worried about him. Soon Miss Pan comes to the class and collects everyone's assignments before telling them about the changes in their curriculum as they reach sophomore year. She then declares that since their school beat the elite Faction 59, the Department of Cultivation has started paying them special attention. Therefore, they are going to conduct an advanced spiritual force test this afternoon, and everyone who has not reached the Foundation level will be kicked from the elite class. Also, those from the normal class that can clear the cutoff will get into the elite class. All the backbenchers scream out as they hear this and Sun Ron realizes that they have not reached the minimum level to pass the test yet. She is confident about her abilities and so is Chen. And even though Gu is nervous, he thinks he will pull through. However, as they talk about their preparation, they suddenly worry about Wang, believing that he lays around all summer. Sun Rong rushes to him and volunteers to send some of her spiritual power into his body to help him pass the test. Chen suggests that he can use a special move from his family that can forcibly make anyone break through the foundation level. They start quarreling about which technique is better for Wang and Gu stops them to tell them that Wang has already left the class. He goes to the washroom where his sword spirit, Jink, pops up and asks him what he's going to do about the test. Wang feels that it will be difficult to conceal his abilities, but then Jink hides as Gu makes his entrance. He reveals that he has found a secret method to create a special pill that can boost the user's spiritual energy for one hour, using which they can temporarily reach the foundation level. He suggests Wang help him create the pill like an old time so that he can pass the test. Wang has figured out his true intentions and asks Gu if he has broken through the foundation stage yet. Gu replies that he got caught and then starts crying and begging Wang to help him because he lays around all summer. He claims that if he doesn't pass the test, his parents will demote him to being homeless. Well, Wang doesn't mind some occasional mischief, so he and Gu reach Froggy and stare menacingly at him to help with their pill refining plan. Meanwhile, Kang has finished setting up the test apparatus in the field. He then explains the procedure for testing, if they have crossed the foundation stage or not. Kang tells everyone that they will have to stand in the center of the test formation and then concentrate their spiritual power just like him. The formation will measure their spiritual power and create a thundercloud above them with corresponding power. The cloud releases a powerful thunderbolt that hits Kang, creating an explosion and releasing black smoke. He then tells the students that they will have to go through the same process and to pass the test, they must endure the lightning strike. The students panic upon seeing the test formation and fear that they will lose their lives if their body is not strong enough. Kang tells them to rest assured because modern cultivation is safe and they won't die because of the lightning. In case anyone gets severely injured, they have an ambulance on standby. That is not much assurance to the students and the first person to take the test gets fried immediately. Sun Rong and Chen are watching the test too and Sun Rong wonders where Wang is. Chen tells her that he is with Guo, and they don't need to worry about them since their class will take the test last. It seems that Miss Pan has noticed the two boys missing, and she goes to the lab where Wang and Guo have finished the prep work, and now they are only waiting for the cooking to be complete. They suddenly hear footsteps and Gu panics that Miss Pan will find them. Wang has an idea, and he drenches themselves in water, and Pan finds them shirtless in the lab. She decides to give them a moment of privacy, but then bursts into the room, saying no homo. She asks them what the hell they are doing here and Gu says that they fell in the pool, so they came here to dry themselves up. Pan asks him about the furnace next and Wang commands Froggy to distract her. Froggy pounces on her and using that chance, Gu quickly takes out the pills from the furnace. As Pan smacks some manners into the dog, she goes to the furnace and opens it only to find some smelly socks inside. She is furious and shouts at the two boys before leaving the lab. Wang is relieved that they were not caught and asks Gu where he hid the pills. He regretfully tells him that he hid them in his stomach moments before going Super Saiyan. The energy from the pills starts overloading his body and he starts squelling to humongous proportions. Wang hits him and releases all the air inside him, knocking him out in the process. Gu wakes up right as it is his turn to participate in the test. He is still processing what happened when he hears Kang call his name and declare that if he doesn't take the test, he will fail by default. Gu runs to the formation, thinking that he will be fine because he took some pills, but as he looks at his watch, he finds that their effect has long expired. He panics and thinks that this is his last day in the elite class. However, as he gathers his spiritual power and survives the lightning, he realizes that he made it through somehow. It was actually Wang's hit that pushed Gu through the bottleneck and made him break through to the intermediate foundation phase. Next up is Wang's turn and Gu worries about him because he did not eat his pill. Kang gives him a safety helmet because his spiritual force value is too low, and his friends are also worried about him. 
Wang stands in the middle of the formation and starts focusing on his spiritual power. Jing pops out and tells him that the formation has a fatal flaw because it was designed with only normal humans in mind. The clouds that gather over Wang cover the entire city and constantly launch powerful lightning at him. While the thunderclouds have an upper limit for the voltage, there is no time limit and Jing tells Wang that the lightning will continue until all the spiritual energy around them is absorbed by the formation. Wang doesn't feel the need to worry, but Sun Ron is terrified that he might not survive the lightning. She rushes to the formation and starts plugging out the formation with Kang's help, and his other friends join them too. However, they cannot pull out the giant ass plug, and the spiritual energy around them starts vanishing quickly. Wang realizes that they need to stop it soon, and he tosses his sword to Sun Rong. As soon as she holds it, she finds herself in the distorted world where she and Wang save each other. He tells her to use the sword to cut the wire safely since wood is an insulator, and she agrees. With one swift strike, Sun Rong cuts through not only the wire but also the ground, the sea, and the clouds. That was all thanks to Jing's power, and Wang comes out of the formation and hands his safety hat to Kang as he asks him if he passed the test. Kang is left speechless because Wang is completely unharmed after taking such intense lightning. While everyone is busy wondering how the device just malfunctioned, no one seems to realize that Jink used too much power in the last cut and accidentally opened a crack in space. Through the crack, the spiritual energy of the Earth flows into the Demon Realm and the Demon Emperor, who rules the place, seems to have noticed it too. He summons his counselor and asks him the reason behind the anomaly he feels in his dimension. The counselor tells him that a crack has opened up in space connecting to the Earth. Talking about Earth reminds the Demon Emperor that he sent a demon frog to conquer it a few years ago. His counselor says that they indeed sent a ferocious demon frog, who was at the level of a demon king to conquer Earth, but they never heard from it again. The demon emperor is furious that the frog is taking too long, unaware that it has become the school pet. He also feels that the spiritual energy of his dimension is going towards Earth through the crack, and the counselor cannot believe it. He claims that the Earth's average spiritual energy was higher than theirs in the past, and if it is absorbing their energy now, it means that the value has declined. Seeing the Emperor furious, the Counselor assures him that he will personally go to Earth and make sure to conquer it. He sends a message to Froggy regarding his visit, who panics on seeing that his master is coming to Earth. Froggy rushes to Wang's home and finds him watching news about how the decreased spiritual energy of the Earth is causing a reduction in agricultural yield. Froggy sits between Wang and his dad, and at the same time the Counselor arrives on Earth through a portal. After breathing in the fresh air filled with refreshing spiritual energy, he pulls out his Iskal 15 and calls Froggy, who shudders upon receiving the notification. He ignores the calls and the messages and Jinky takes a look at his phone before asking him who the person claiming to be his master is. Froggy reveals that the counselor is the embodiment of all the wisdom of the demon realm. He is an immortal demon as old as the universe itself, and he serves as the teacher of budding demon kings. Froggy exclaims that he spent a long time under his guidance, and that was the worst time of his life. Jink realizes that he is so afraid of the counselor that he came here to hide. Soon, Wang's mom serves dinner, and everyone sits down to eat. Wang's dad is working on some new amulet that will make Wang more expressive, and he wants Froggy to help him with that. Wang's mom complains that he better succeed because the cost of spiritual ingredients has been too high recently. Later, Wang's dad finishes crafting a new amulet prototype and asks Froggy to put it on Wang the moment he removes the old one. They work in sync and press some acupressure points to calm Wang's energy as they exchange the amulets. It is a success, but then Wang starts speaking gibberish, making his dad realize that Froggy messed up and put the amulet upside down. Wang's energy is about to explode because of this small accident, but before it can destroy the world, Froggy takes action and bites him, absorbing all his excess energy. After that, they put the amulet correctly, and soon Miss Pan pays their home a visit. The new amulet starts showing its effects immediately as Wang cordially greets her and welcomes her to his home. Miss Pan is here to complain about his poor performance and lack of enthusiasm at school, but Wang's mom is happy as long as her son can enjoy his school life normally. However, because of the new amulet, Wang has suddenly become full of energy like he drank a hundred Red Bulls. He completes all his pending assignments instantly and even presents the pills he refined previously. On top of that, he uses his power and gives life to some pencils and erasers, making them follow his command. Miss Pan has nothing else to say since Wang successfully did something other students were struggling to do yet. She tells him that only one pencil and eraser will be enough to prove that he has learned it, and with a snap of his fingers, Wang takes away the life from the remaining objects. While Pan praises him, his parents are discussing what's happening. Wang's mom wants to know what was in the amulet, and his dad remarks that he might have become aggressively outgoing as a result. 
He asks his wife to distract the teacher while he makes amends to the amulet. Wang's mom offers to show Miss Pan around the house and drags her along, while his dad and Froggy once again start working on exchanging the amulet. This time, Wang's dad has adjusted his expressive nature perfectly, and Wang speaks like normal people do. However, he still feels that something is odd, and just as he says that, the objects in their living room start shaking. As Wang's mom comes down from her home tour, she is shocked to see that all the household items in the room have suddenly gained sentience. She can't let the instructor see this, so she takes her away, claiming that she needs to talk to her in private. They go upstairs, where Miss Pan learns that both of Wang's parents are weak cultivators, and Wang never had any friends till he reached high school. She is touched to learn his story, while he is using Froggy as a spiritual shotgun and hitting the sentient objects to turn them normal again. After he is done turning everything back to normal, Froggy is burned out and so is Wang's amulet. His dad wants to fix it using Froggy's help again, but he can't focus on anything because he suddenly feels his master's presence. Until now, he was hiding his spiritual energy to prevent being detected by him. But since he used it just now, the counselor has located him. Froggy shudders as the counselor teleports in front of Wang's home, he feels like his spirit is leaving his body. Meanwhile, Wang's dad panics because the amulet is about to malfunction, and to prevent an explosion, he decides to forcibly remove it. Just as he does that, an intense surge of spiritual force is released from Wang's body. Coincidentally, the counselor opened the door to their house at that exact same moment, and he got hit by the spiritual beam that was strong enough to instantly melt a nearby hill. Wang feels relieved as all the excess energy is released from his body, and he turns perfectly normal by the time his mom and Miss Pan come down. Pan bids everyone goodbye, remarking that she has learned that good grades are not everything in life and telling Wang that he should try his best without overexerting himself. She leaves with that, and soon after that, Froggy comes back to his senses. As he thinks that everything is fine now, he finds his master's crown beneath his feet and realizes that he met his unfortunate end because of Wang's immense power. A few days later, Hu shows his friends a picture of the world's best assassin, who suddenly went missing 10 years ago. He claims that there is an interesting story behind it, and the assassin codenamed Idler was on a flight with his girlfriend when suddenly, their sword plane was struck by severe turbulence and exploded. He was sucked out of the plane, vanished without a trace after that day, and has never been since after that. Chen asks if he died, but Gu doesn't believe that. He claims that Idler survived the crash, and he has been living in seclusion ever since. On top of that, he has heard rumors online about his girlfriend, Yu, who was presumed dead, being spotted near their school. Just then, Miss Pan comes to the class and tells everyone to go back to their seats. She then introduces a new addition to the elite class who performed really well in the last spiritual force measuring test. As a nerdy girl wearing thick spectacles enters the class, Wang suddenly recognizes her as the girl he saw in the parallel world without Sunrom and even Jink seems to recognize her. He keeps staring at the seemingly shy and timid girl and Sun Rong mistakes that for him looking at her. After that, the new girl introduces herself as Lin Xiaoyu, and Pan tells everyone to get along well with her because she comes from a really poor background. Later that day, Wang and his friends keep talking about the story of assassins in the washroom. Hu claims that the current leader of the Shadow Faction, Lu Ying, is being held under their school. Chen remarks that it won't be difficult for someone like her to escape, but Gu says that if they can trap the demon frog under their school for a decade, they can hold Luying for some time as well. Just then, they see the Assassin King's girlfriend, Yu, walking in front of them, and Chen immediately gives chase, with his friends following him. They follow the girl into a storeroom and find that it seems empty at the moment, but someone definitely lives there. They sneak around to find any clues for a while, when suddenly, they hear someone coming in and hide under the table. One who enters the room is Ling Xiaoyu, and as she starts undressing, Gu and Chen freak out and come out from under the table. They get labeled as graded perverts, and Lin confronts them. Chen explains that they were just looking for you, but Lin doesn't believe him and throws a broom at him. It hits the statue behind them and activates a hidden switch in its head, which opens a trapdoor beneath them. The three of them fall down, and Wang calmly follows them. Meanwhile, Yu has reached the prison where Lu Ying, her younger sister, is being held. She is relieved to see her elder sister and asks her to free her so that they can revive the Shadow Faction. She is in for the shock of her life as Yu points her spirit bow at her. She tells Lu Ying that she's a failure because she couldn't complete the mission of killing Sun Rong and shoots a warning shot that grazes her cheek before hitting the floor behind her. Before Yu can do anything else, Gu and others fall from the roof, screaming like crazy. Wang is also behind them, and he apologizes to the assassin for intruding on her family reunion. He then finds a safe room to land and creates a portal, leading all his friends there. They land in a dark room, and as Wang switches on the light, he finds that it is Idler's secret base. Everyone starts looking around, and they finally find a wall of clues, 
in which the greatest assassin seems to be investigating the accident that separated him from his girl. Back at the prison, Yu reveals that the cause of the accident was a portal to the demon world, and she got sucked into that. She lived in the demon world for 10 years, translating documents between human and demon languages. One day, she found an assassination contract aimed at killing her, and the one who received it was none other than her younger sister. On the other hand, Wang and friends deduce the truth soon enough too. Gu puts the things they know on the map and says that 10 years ago, three very important things happened on the same day. First, the airship carrying Yu and Idler exploded and she got sucked out of it. Second, the demon frog came to Earth from a giant portal, and third, Zhu defeated it. Suddenly, everything starts making sense to Wang as he remembers the incidents of that day. After he kicked the demon frog, the spiritual cannon it was charging was shot abruptly and caused great destruction, which hit the airplane carrying Idler and Yu. He had seen the airplane fall uncontrollably and tried to balance it with his spiritual force, but in doing that, Yu was sucked out of the plane because she was not wearing a seatbelt. The plane was brought to safety, but Idler could only cry for his girlfriend. After that, Yu went off the grid and holed up below the Faction 60 school to search for her. Everyone starts crying, thinking about the epic romance between the two assassins, but Wan only face palms at the entire situation. Right now, Yu faces Luying, accusing her of causing the plane blast to get rid of her and overtake the Shadow Faction. Luying replies that she had nothing to do with the blast even though she was eyeing her position. Yu doesn't trust her and shoots an arrow aimed at her head, but Kang comes out of nowhere and stops it. He tells Yu that she is mistaken about the accident and reveals that he is her boyfriend, Idler. Yu starts smiling through tears as she remarks that he has put on some weight and Kang tells her that he decided to stay at the school to search for her. Whenever he felt depressed about losing her, he ate all kinds of junk food to feel better, and now he has become like this. They are happy to reunite and share a romantic kiss, and Luying screams that she would rather die than see such a sight. She yells at her sister to stop making her jealous, but Yu and Kang do not hear her, and they leave for their delayed honeymoon. Later, as Wei and his friends take the elevator to return to the surface, they run into Yu and Kang, who has kiss marks all over their faces. Wang takes one look at them, then at them, and finally realizes everything. Soon after that, Kang takes a class on how to properly care for one's spiritual swords. He claims that due to improper use, the spiritual swords may become blunt and slow to ride on. And that is why they will soon have an annual workshop on sword maintenance. Jink tells Wang that he has never been maintained since he was created, so he is looking forward to it, but Wang still can't get Lin out of his head. Later, as he is taking the train home with his friends, Sun Rong reveals that her sword Ocean has been reforged, but her sword spirit has not yet revived after being sacrificed to bring forth Gu's phoenix. Chen says that he regularly maintains his sword using a toolkit he bought online, and Sun Rong warns him that big swords need to be taken to authorized repair shops for proper maintenance. Go says that he has a 20% discount coupon on a repair shop near his home, and Sun Rong shows off her wealth by displaying the VIP passes to all repair shops in the area. She turns to Wang and asks him if he would like to join them this weekend to get his sword repaired, unaware of the fact that Jink is already out repairing himself in the company of some sugar mommies. The next weekend, Sun Rong takes her friends to a top-class sword repair shop. Gu and Chen can't stop gawking at the various legendary swords in the store like any real man would when suddenly Lin approaches them. She works part-time at the store and repairs and restores spirit swords. Lin tells everyone that she grew up surrounded by swords and her caretaker was her sword spirit itself, who was like her elder sister. Her parents had already left to get milk by then, and one day, the sword spirit also left to get herself repaired, never to return. Since then, Lin has been working at different repair shops, hoping to see her spirit sister someday. Chen is moved that Lin never got another sword because she loved her previous one too much, but that is just a clown moment because she is just too broke to get another. Wang then asks her what she plans to do for the annual sword workshop the next week, and Lin has no answer. Suddenly, Tang comes there and starts mocking the 60 students in the faction for being so poor that they can't even afford a sword. He says that he will help her earn some money and a good bonus on top of that, and he throws a bunch of swords at her, asking her to repair and polish them fully by tomorrow. Lin says that it will take at least three days, but Tang is not ready to hear her out. Sun Rong uses her VIP pass to book Lin for the day so that she can avoid being harassed, but she stops her, saying that she can complete the job if she works overtime. Lin says that she gets paid for each sword she repairs. She desperately wants money, and her body is not good enough for only fans either. As Wei and his friends leave her, they complain that this was straightforward bullying. Sun Rong suggests that she can buy a sword for Lin so that she doesn't have to work so hard, but Chen thinks that it will not be good for her self-esteem. 
As they are discussing their options, Wong stops in front of the self-help forging area, where anyone can forge a sword and keep it. He plans to forge a sword for Lin here, and everyone hails him as a genius. Lin leaves the store late at night and locks it, unaware of the fact that her friends have snuck inside. Sun Rong has gotten permission from the owner while Wang has prepared a design for the sword, and everyone has decided to pitch in for the raw materials. Sun Rong reads the manual and suggests that they get the raw materials evaluated first. Gu places the fang of a beast he bought online on the scanner and learns that it is level and material. He is proud of that, but Chen tells him to get aside as he places an action figure made from a meteorite on the scanner that turns out to be a level as material. Gu is shocked and asks where he got it from and Chen replies that he stole it from his dad. Next up is Sun Rong and she has brought a level as plus potion. The boys are amazed to see that, but she refuses to tell them where she got it from. Lastly, Wine brings out the crown and the demon counselor that he found lying in front of his home. He doesn't even know about its value or origin, and as he places it on the scanner, the device reaches all the way up to level SSS and then breaks because the crown is way beyond its capacity to measure. With that, they start working on forging the sword and throw all the raw material into the furnace. The next morning, as Lin returns to the store and starts her routine work, she finds her friends waiting for her. They present the wavy sword they forged for her and Lin is moved to tears. Everyone thinks that she is crying because the sword is badly made and they apologize that they couldn't do better. Lin tells them that is not it and she puts the new sword in the sheath of her old one and it fits perfectly. Sun Rong realizes that Wang knew it and that is why he deliberately designed the sword in this way. Lin is really happy to receive it and exclaims that it is the best gift of her life. Just then, Tang comes there along with the store manager who follows him around like his pet dog. He mocks the ugly sword they made for Lin before using his VIP pass to ask her to duel him to judge his sword's abilities. Sun Rong pulls out her VIP pass too, but the manager rules in favor of Tang because the store is owned by his company. Chen tells Lin that she doesn't need to risk going against the asshole, but she badly needs the job and takes up the challenge to duel him. They go to the arena and Lin wears full body armor. Tang summons his sword spirit, immediately ending the effect of global warming on the store. He effortlessly cuts through a metal block to show off his power, and Lin is terrified. Tang points his sword at her, creating a blizzard before rushing towards her. She is terrified and instinctively blocks his attack with her sword, and then suddenly, hundreds of demonic eyes start staring at Tang. He finds himself alone in the vast universe before Lin's sword shows its true demonic ability. It shoots a curse at Tang's sword that spreads all over his body and starts sucking out the spiritual force of both him and his sword. He starts shriveling as his energy leaves his body, but then the door opens and something whizzes past them, breaking his sword and freeing Tang from the curse at the last moment. Sun Rong and others jump to the arena to celebrate their friend's victory, and Wang summons Jink back to him, who was the one who saved Tang just now. Later that night, something strange happens at the school. A black gooey fluid starts gathering and taking shape till it becomes the counselor, who is finally revived. He panics as he finds his crown missing, but then notices it hanging from the hilt of Lin's sword. To take it back, the counselor attacks Lin and possesses her body. He goes mad with rage as he demands to know who the person was who took his crown of chaos and made it into a vulgar sword. He uses a special move called Soul Search and sees a collection of Lin's memories, in which Sun Rong is the one who presented the sword to her. The counselor in Lin's body laughs menacingly and envelops her new body in a demonic aura. Apparently, Sun Rong's ancestor did a number on the counselor and on the demon realm as well, and now he plans to exact his vengeance. The next day, a festival called Autumn Reunion Day is being celebrated, which is pretty much the Valentine's Day of cultivators. People make talismans to gift to their loved ones, wishing for their wellness. Wang, Guo, and Chen are spying on a couple when Kang arrives there and confiscates the talisman the girl was giving her boyfriend. Seeing this scene, Sun Rong starts wondering how she can give her talisman to Wang when suddenly Lin pops behind her. She suggests she break the rules and stay in the school at night along with Wang and give him the gift then. Meanwhile, Gu tells his friends about the mirror in the school basement, which is set to show the future on this night every year. Chen is excited to check it out, but when he learns about supernatural stories surrounding the mirror, like hearing the voice of a girl and seeing her come out of the toilet, he gives up quickly. Wang is ignoring them for the sake of his crispy noodles when Sun Rong enters the classroom, pats his head with a ruler in Morse code, refuses to elaborate, and leaves. That was a signal for Wang to meet her at the school gate at night, and even though he doesn't understand it, his nosy friends figure it out for him. At night, Wang pays Sun Rong a visit at the school gate, but he is not alone. Gu and Chen tag along and Sun Rong is not happy to have them. They decide to seek out the mirror that shows the future, and Chen gets scared of a passing cat. 
He tries to put on a brave face after that, but as he suddenly runs into Lin, he pisses his pants. Sun Ron reveals that she asked Lin to be their guide since she lives on the school campus, but Wang notices something off about her. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking, and they hear the scary laughter of a woman. They wonder what is happening, unaware of the fact that it was all Lu Ying's doing. She became Yandu from the Guardians of the Galaxy and controlled the arrow left behind by her sister and break free from her prison. Now that she is free, she wants to find an escape route, and luckily, she sees a crack in the wall from which water is coming out. It leads her to the sewage system, and she climbs up the pipes around the same time Gu and Chen are relieving themselves. They feel some vibrations coming from a toilet, and as soon as Gu opens it, a strong gush of water pushes him to the wall. Chen passes out of fright first, and then Gu follows as he sees a hand coming out of the toilet. Wang and the girls rush to help them upon hearing their scream. While Sun Rong wakes up Gu, Wang notices Lu Ying escaping from the toilet, so he simply flushes her like the shit she is, and sends her back to where she came from. It seems like she has borrowed someone's plot armor because she lands in Kang's secret base and finds an elevator. Meanwhile, Sun Rong places amulets on the faces of her unconscious friends while wondering what made them pass out. Lin suggests that they should continue their adventure and Sun Rong thinks it is her chance to be alone with Wang. However, as he learns that Lu Ying is escaping again, he decides to stop her first. He finds her at the elevator and sends her crashing through the floor. Sun Ron and Lin come running to find only a hole, and then Lin takes her leave to give the couple some privacy. Jenk and Wang have both noticed the demon hiding inside her, but they don't want to be bothered just yet. Wang and Sun Rong walk around the school and finally arrive at the mirror, where she fidgets before giving him the talisman she made. However, just as she is about to give it to him, Lin arrives there and punches Wang across the hallway. Sun Rong doesn't understand what is going on, but then she sees Lin's reflection in the mirror and finds that she is actually a demon. She draws her swords to fight her, but the counselor restrains her instantly before telling her that the mirror is actually a gateway to the demon realm. He says that on this night he can open the door to the demon realm and take her there for vengeance. He inserts his hand in the mirror, and the moon and the rest of the world are suddenly engulfed in a red hue. The passage to the demon realm is open and the counselor pulls Sun Rong towards him. However, Luing has once again come to the surface and she attacks Sun Rong, declaring that no one can take away her prey. Suddenly, Wang unleashes his power and speeds across the hallway, saving Sun Rong from harm because he does not want to lose her again. Luing's attack hits Lin and expels the soul of the counselor residing within her. The demon is sent into the demon realm, and the mirror shatters along with the portal. Luing curses Wang, saying that he fouled her plans once again, and in return, he sends her crashing through the building with a punch. He then lays Sun Rong on the ground and takes her talisman while smiling to himself. The next day, as Wang is busy listening to music, Gu shakes him and points out that Chen's father is punishing him at the school gate. Everyone is gathered to watch the drama, and they learn that Chen's spiritual level has fallen because he is watching too many Twitch livestreams. His father asks him the reason behind his downfall, and he replies that his favorite e-girl's master is sick, and she asks for donations to help him recover. So he sent some of his spiritual energy to her so that her master could get better. Chen's father accepts this as alleged reason because helping those in need is their family's motto. He begins walking away, but then asks his son where their family treasure medicine is. He feigns ignorance, but the streamer girl suddenly talks about a kind follower who sent her a precious medicine. Chen's dad loses his cool and attacks him, only slashing his smartphone and telling him that if he is ever found supporting Hose online, he will be expelled from the family. Later, his friends wonder how Chen can fall so badly for someone, and Lin suggests that it might be black magic. She explains that in the past, demons used to take on the shape of beautiful women to trap unsuspecting humans and slowly drain their spiritual energy. She believes the same is happening to Chen, and Go believes that the problem is solved since his phone was destroyed. That is just wishful thinking, because Chen is in the computer lab and talking to his favorite e-girl using school Wi-Fi. Everyone realizes that he is hopeless, and Lin suggests that the easiest way to save Chen is to reveal the truth about the e-girl. She thinks that a skilled cultivator can infiltrate the Wi-Fi system and disrupt her spell, but Gu says he has another way. He hacks into the computer and releases his digital spiritual pet virus inside it. He then types the web address of the e-girl and sends the virus to her system. However, she has an antivirus system in place and Gu's pet is destroyed. Wang then gets another idea, which is to use the art of seduction on Chen to save him. Sun Rong gives Chen a cola, and just as he drinks it, she uses her seduction spell to hypnotize him. On her command, he is ready to end the video call and return home, but the fox e-girl won't let it happen. She uses all of her charms and says that she wanted to talk to Chen for longer, and he cannot resist her anymore despite Sun Rong's control. 
Her mark on his head breaks, and Sun Rong is devastated that she lost in a competition of seduction. The fox girl keeps on absorbing spiritual energy from Chen, as she truly wants to revive her master, but he is none other than the counselor. As Wang's friends wonder how they can save Chen, Chen's dad comes there. He remarks that in his youth he was also a great simp, but his son has left him far behind. He starts crying, but as he hears that Chen is still spending money and spiritual energy on the fox girl, he can't control his rage and slashes the monitor in half. Chen is devastated by losing the connection and he disobeys his father's order to return home. Instead, he uses a high-level technique to go into cyberspace. He puts an HEMI plug into his body and with a bright flash, his spirit enters cyberspace. Chen comes out of the monitor in the fox girl's room and starts looking for her. Shockingly, her room is a dark cave with a cutout resembling her room. Suddenly, he feels someone behind him, and he turns around to see a horrid monster. Chen backs away, wondering who the monster is, when it suddenly takes on the face of the fox girl. He realizes that he has been catfished by an ugly demon and tries to attack her, but it is useless as his spirit cannot harm the monster's physical body. However, the demon can suck him up using a good old vacuum cleaner. Chen holds on for his dear life when suddenly he sees Sun Rong on the monitor. The demon tells him that his friends won't be able to save him, but she is wrong because suddenly a hand comes out of the screen and punches her away before dragging Chen's soul back. It was Wang who had entered cyberspace himself, and he successfully brought Chen back to his body. Later that night, Wang watches news about Zhu and his team cracking down the base of the ugly monster. They have recovered the spiritual energy that was collected from stupid simps, but the main culprits behind the scam are missing. Wang doesn't care about that, but the next news grabs his attention. The Flower Curtain Group, which is the company owned by Sun Rong's family, has been declared bankrupt, and they can no longer pay their debts. Soon, Wang and friends decide to pay Sun Rong a visit at her new home, and they find that they have moved to their ancestral property, which is a magical mountain, full of spiritual energy. They wonder how to find them here when suddenly Sun Rong comes to them swinging on tree branches like Tarzan. Her family has adopted the caveman way of life after mortgaging everything they had to pay their debts. Wang asks her how it happened, and Sun Rong tells him that their flower curtain group was a pharma company that specialized in making magic pills. Because the average spiritual energy value of the earth dropped, a harvest of special crops to make the pills declined. Thus, the production took a hit, and they could not repay their debts. Despite all this, Sun Rong's parents are optimistic that their time will come if they keep working hard. They claim that their family rose to wealth from humble beginnings, and if they keep working hard, they will soon regain their position. Her dad cheers for a bright future, and everyone joins him. Meanwhile, Tang's family celebrates the downfall of their eternal rivals. They thank a certain shady man named Richmond, who was responsible for the Sun family's downfall. He was the one who created problems for the flower curtain group through clever manipulation of the stock market. However, Richmond is not satisfied with that, and he wants to take away the ancestral mountain of Sun Rong's family from them as well. Tang thanks him for all he has done and asks him why he is helping them. Richmond replies that he just wants a lot of spiritual energy, and it is better if it comes at the Sun family's expense. Back at the mountain, Sun Rong's dad tells the kids stories about his glory days, while Wang and Sun Rong talk by the window. Sun Rong shows him a water stream and states that it once used to be a great waterfall that shielded the cave. However, now it is about to die out, and when it does, the spiritual value of the mountain will become zero. Wang says that he can help her, but Sun Rong refuses to take his help because of her pride. They return home after that and almost get hit by a reckless car. They take the train, where they hear the news that Tang's family is going to purchase all the assets of the Sun family and their hairs are going to get married. Everyone panics upon hearing this news and wonders how it could happen so suddenly, and Lin can't even call Sun Rong. Wang says that the limo that passed them by when they were leaving the mountain was from Tang's family, and he decides to go back to the mountain to help their friend. They are armed with their swords and approach the mountain, ready to wage war. Tang's lackeys are also there to stop them, and the ginger guy is the first line of defense. He tells Wang's group to return, but Gu reminds him that he got his ass whooped badly at the sword tournament. Ginger taunts him that it won't happen again, and Chen rushes at him. Ginger too also comes there, so Gu joins the fight too. Gu and Chen attack, but they can't move because of Yisha's spiritual web. However, Lin stays behind to back them up and releases spiritual butterflies that shatter the web of her control. Gu and Chen can continue their fight and Lin chases after Yisha. Using them as decoys, Wang runs towards the mountain, where the guests have assembled. Tang's father declares that today the grudge between the two families will finally end. They will buy all of the Sun family's property and their children will get married too, making the two families one. He calls Sun Rong and Tang to sign the marriage contract with their blood. Tang signs it first and then passes it to Sun Rong, asking her to hurry up. 
Just as she is about to cut her thumb, Wang holds her hand and runs away with her. Tang immediately commands the guards to go after them, but Wang and Sun Rong reunite with their friends who have won their fights. However, just then, Sun Rong's dad calls out to her, and she lets go of Wang's hand, telling him that she is marrying Tang out of her own will. She explains that after he left yesterday, Tang's dad came to them with a proposal to save their company if Sun Rong marries her son. She outright refused to marry the douchebag, but her parents had other plans. They pressured her to hear out the details of the arrangement, claiming that getting their company running was for the greater good. Sun Rong could not fight against the pressure and realized that she must serve as the heir to the Flower Curtain group and walk on this hard path. Now Sun Rong apologizes to Wang and her other friends, saying that she is ready to sacrifice her life. They sadly go their separate paths, and Wang can't stop staring at the talisman that Sun Rong gifted him. They pass through the pool of water at the base of the mountain, and Wang realizes something. He rushes into the small pool and yanks out a tentacle of an ancient parasite demon out of it. Lin knows about it and remarks that it is a star worm that is infamous for sucking out the spiritual energy of the place it resides in. They realize that this parasite is responsible for draining the spiritual energy of the magic mountain, and Wang tries to pull it out of the ground. However, they still have no idea that the person called Richmond, who is actually a demon, is behind this. Wang's friends join him, and they finally pluck out the giant parasite demon from the ground. Wang commands it to return all the spiritual energy it stole, and the demon starts glowing as it returns the spiritual power because of his command. The parasite explodes, releasing a golden pillar of light, which then turns into a water fountain. Sun Rong was about to sign the marriage contract when this happened, and she couldn't believe that the waterfall of their magic mountain was flowing backwards. Tang's dad tries to convince her that it isn't anything major and says they should get back to the ceremony. Suddenly, his secretary comes running to tell him that the value of their company's stocks has nosedived and become close to zero. Right after that, Sun Rong's bodyguard rushes into the room to inform everyone that the value of their stocks is rising back at a great rate. As everyone wonders what is going on, Zhu arrives at the scene with his special forces squad. He declares that they found evidence of the Tang group collaborating with the demon realm to ruin the Sun family, which is why all their assets have been frozen and they are to be immediately detained. While Tang and his family are aghast, Sun Rong's family and friends are delighted. As her servants congratulate her on her family's revival, she spots Wang at the window and smiles at him. Soon after that, the Got Talent of Cultivators named National Sword Dance Show is organized to judge the growing cultivators on their ability to handle their spirit swords with beauty and grace. The judges for the tournament are Zhuo, Instructor Xi from Faction 59, and two teen idols famous for their sword dance skills. The competition starts and the first participant is none other than Sun Rong. She introduces herself to the judges and Sai immediately remarks that in the sword competition last year, half of her swords as well as her sword spirit were destroyed. Sun Rong says that she knows that, and it is the reason she is here to improve her abilities in handling a sword under the guidance of the expert judges. She then declares that she will show them the special skill of the Sun family called Ocean Dance. Sun Rong commands a dozen swords at a time and dances gracefully with them, unaware of the fact that the demon Richman lurks beneath the building and he uses a special device to make her swords malfunction. The swords go berserk, some of them attacking Sun Rong while the others darting towards Xi. Luckily, Kang was in the audience and he saved her life thanks to his quick reflexes. After that, Zhu tells Sun Rong that she was trying to do something she has not mastered yet and everyone starts mocking her. Sun Rong sadly collects her swords and walks out of the stage where Lin and Wan are waiting for her. She claims to be useless without her sword spirit, and Lin asks her to bring her swords to her store so she can calibrate them for her. Wang also puts his coat around her, telling her that it was not her fault, and they take their seats. Due to the accident, the show's popularity suddenly rises, and the next participants are Gu and Chen, who are going to perform as a team. They dedicate their performance to Sun Rong, who has been struggling a lot recently, but that has not stopped her from smiling. Chen declares that he will now stop a blow from Gu with his bare hands while blindfolded. They get into formation, and just as Gu is about to strike, a demon under the ground intervenes again and makes him lose control of the sword. Gu strikes Chen faster than planned, hitting him on the head and making him lose spiritual energy. Gu uses his wits to say that their true performance was to demonstrate Chen's iron head technique, and he apologizes to everyone before running away. Suspiciously, the rating of the program increases even further, and the viewers keep on increasing. The next performer is Yisha from Faction 59, and she uses her cybernetic modifications to control hundreds of swords at once, mesmerizing the audience. Meanwhile, Gu and Chen take their seats next to Sun Rong, and they find that Wang and Lin have gone missing. The host announces that their last performer for the day is Lin, and she comes out wearing a traditional dress. 
Everyone is smitten by her beauty now that she has removed her nerdy glasses. Lin begins her performance by releasing petals made of spiritual energy from her sword that make the grass she is standing on grow. She doesn't stop at that, and she uses her sword's energy to grow a mature tree in a matter of seconds. The audience starts cheering her on, but then suddenly, she sets the tree on fire. Her next trick is to make the flame go out with the swing of her sword, but it doesn't happen no matter how many times she tries. Lin becomes frustrated as the burning tree starts falling. Sun Rong notices that she is in danger, and she immediately rushes to help her and forcibly summons out her sword spirit that is turned into a miniature version. With the help of the sword spirit, she uses her waterbending skills and puts out the fire quickly. Lin sees this as a chance to stage an even greater performance, and she revitalizes the dead tree, while Sun Rong creates a fountain in the garden, completing the scenery. The audience and the judges are left stunned by their performance, and the viewership numbers break all records. As Sun Rong and Lin are receiving their praise, Demon Richmond, who had been fiddling with them, suddenly comes on the stage. He reveals that his plan was to collect enough spiritual energy to unleash his grand skill, and that is why he hijacked the show. The demon uses his ultimate control technique, and suddenly, red spiritual energy starts seeping out from beneath the stage. It latches onto the audience and then travels across cyberspace and infects everyone watching the program on their screens and even those who did not watch the program too. Everyone under the influence of his energy falls under his control and becomes a mindless puppet. Richmond laughs, saying that now he has gained control of all humans on Earth, and he is their true master. However, he is shocked when he sees that Sun Rong and Lin are not under the effect of his spell. He wonders how that can happen and Wang comes forth to tell him that he foiled his plans. Wang moved the center of the formation Richmond laid out by two meters, making it fall under the girl's feet, turning them into the true masters of the spell. Suddenly, everyone under the effect of his spell has the mark of Sun Rong over their heads. Richmond freaks out on seeing them and decides to do this the good old way by fighting it out. Suddenly, the anchor of the show comes to stop him and unleashes all this spiritual energy to turn into Sylvester Stallone. He sends Richmond to outer space with just one punch, but the girls notice that he is not in his right mind. Suddenly, the audience starts moving towards the stage like mindless zombies and Sun Rong tries to break the control spell on them, but it is of no use. Lin tells her that it is not a simple control spell but has demonic energy deeply tied to it, so it might be very difficult to break it. Wang, Sun Rong, and Lin run out and hide from the zombies while holding whatever weapon they can find. They believe that they won't be caught if they don't make a noise and crawl away, but a creep clicks their picture and posts it online. The zombies find out their location and swarm them, but they somehow escape them. Jing tells Wang that if he uses his grand trick of forgetting, he can break the control spell, but he refuses to do so. Wang reasons that the general public is already stupid enough and their IQ will fall to negative if he uses his grand trick of forgetting. He then rides on his sword and carries the two girls to the top of the building, thinking they can stay safe here for the time being. Lin says that they need to find a way to break the control spell, but normal methods won't work. Suddenly, something hits Sun Rong from behind, and as she angrily looks down, she finds that the zombies are crawling up the building like ants. She is creeped out, but the ultimate shock is still waiting for her. Wang points towards Chen, who is also under the influence of the control spell. He gathers his spiritual energy and runs like the Flash, climbing over the building in an instant. He tells Sun Rong that he likes her, and she simply tells him that she doesn't like him. Ken falls on hearing those words and clutches his heart as the effect of the control spell breaks. Lin believes it is because he got hit on the head, but as Chen clutches his aching heart, Sun Rong realizes that she just needs to break the hearts of the people to make them return to normal. She tries it on the crowd of zombies and yells that she doesn't like any of them. The spell wears off immediately, and they return to normal. Now that they have found the way to break the control spell, Lin suggests Sun Rong start a live stream to connect to everyone at once, but there is no signal. Suddenly, they hear someone laughing from the nearby tower and find that it is Lu Ying, who escaped from the prison once again, thanks to the confusion caused by the ultimate control spell. She declares that she will never let Sun Rong break the control spell using her live stream, but she is too far away to be heard clearly, and Wang's group only sees her babbling like an idiot. They then spot a Miura heading towards her and try to warn her, but it is too late, and she gets destroyed along with the tower. Wang uses his spiritual energy to investigate the cause of the meteorite falling here suddenly, and finds that it was Richmond who was aiming at them. Now Sun Rong is depressed because she knows that there is no tower near them for hundreds of miles and Wang points at the sky, saying they can take help from the International Space Station there. Chen says that they can reach the entire world from there, but it is impossible to enter it without permission. Wang shows him two tickets to the space station that were rewards for winning the sword dance competition, but he just swiped them from the host. 
He then carries his friends on top of his wooden sword and rides forth, but the sword can't bear that much weight, and they crash land. The zombies rush towards them, and Chen steps up to stop them. Lin decides to join him, and then they ask Wang to help Sun Rong save the world at all costs. They start fighting the zombies while Wang and Sun Rong board the train that will take them to the space station. The train lifts off and only their compartment heads to outer space, where Sun Rong becomes conscious of the fact that she is alone with Wang. He says that he has something to tell her and Sun Rong starts thinking that he will finally propose to her. However, all Wang wanted to say was that they got on the train without getting their tickets checked. Sun Rong is disappointed, but there is no time for that as the train docks at the International Space Station. Once they reach the space station, Sun Rong starts her live stream and addresses everyone. She starts with her life story and how she was always loved because she was the daughter of a rich family. However, after her family went bankrupt, she realized that most of those people never really cared for her. That is why she joined the sword dance competition to gain the love of many people, and she got it, but not in the way she wanted. Sun Rong declares that she has realized that she doesn't need the love of the entire world, and just the love of one special man is enough for her. Everyone is heartbroken as they hear this and the spell control limit breaks, while Wang is also taken aback by Sun Rong's bold gesture. He goes and stands next to her, where she tells him that she rejected the entire world for him. Suddenly, they spot a huge meteorite heading towards the Earth. Sun Rong is worried, but Wang tells her to chill. He throws his sword at the meteorite, shattering it into a thousand harmless parts that burn out on entering the Earth's atmosphere and present the people below with a magnificent meteor shower. Sun Rong is happy to see it, and then Wang shares his crispy noodles with her. She realizes that it is equal to him giving her an engagement ring, so she takes it. The meteorite was not going towards Earth naturally, but it was being manipulated by the demon Richmond. A few moments ago, as Richmond was executing his plan to destroy the Earth, the demon counselor tried to stop him as his goal was to conquer the Earth. However, he refused to listen to him because he had understood that instead of targeting Sun Rong, they should target Wang, who was the real threat to them. The counselor was not convinced, but the demon emperor asked him to let Richmond do what he wanted. Richmond then transformed into his snake-like form as he rode the meteorite, only to be annihilated by Wang's attack. As the demon emperor sees this, he is furious and orders his counselor to prepare for war. On his command, the counselor lights the dimension torches, which are a special artifact. Meanwhile, Wang and Sun Rong plan to enjoy their date on the International Space Station a bit longer, but as they pass a gate, they suddenly find themselves turned into crappy 3D CGI animations. Sun Rong panics, wondering what in the fourth wall breaking Deadpool is this, and then Wang points out that the Earth still looks the same old. The demon army prepares for war and the counselor creates a giant portal to connect their world to Earth. The demons invade Earth and start wreaking havoc, chasing people and destroying buildings. The bigwigs in charge of Earth's defense organize a meeting, and Zhu tells them that the Special Forces squad cannot fight the demons right now because they are too busy evacuating civilians. However, he has an idea to defeat the demons once and for all. Zhu explains that there is a crack in space-time over the school in Faction 60. Also, there is an advanced testing machine there, and a few months ago, it malfunctioned while testing Wang and released high-power thunderbolts constantly. He suggests that they can rig the testing machine and kill the demons in one go, but the world's strongest cultivation practitioner is not available right now. The clown, who is the number two, declares that he will operate the machine and prove to everyone that he is as strong as the number one. Zhu and the Special Forces squad try to distract the demons while number two prepares the machine, but the task seems too hard for them. Meanwhile, Wang and Sun Rong are stuck in a 3D loop with no way to get out. Wang covers Sun Rong in a protective aura and then breaks the wall of the space station, hoping to escape from their CGI prison. He breaks through the wall, only to find themselves in front of them, peeking through the wall they just broke. It is not just one, but an infinitely repeating loop of Wang and Sun Rong, trapped in the dimensional prison. Sun Rong wonders how they can escape from this prison and Wang replies that if his sword, Jink, were here he could break them free in an instant, but he threw him a bit hard, and he is returning from Jupiter right now. On his throne, the demon emperor laughs at seeing the greatest threat to the demon army held captive by the counselor's spell. The counselor is pleased to hear praise from his master and says that because some of the dimensional lamps were toppled accidentally, his dimensional prison is not perfect, but it is still good enough to hold even Wong. In the space station, Sun Rong has lost hope of ever getting out of the dimensional prison, and she fears that even if they get out eventually, the world will have been destroyed. Wang is busy trying to figure something out, and he finally manages to crack the matrix and alter the animation style once again, turning themselves into high-spec and high-frame-rate 3D characters. 
They look at the Earth and find a giant cyclone raging. In the skies above the Faction 60 school, Zhu has been cornered by a giant demon, who tells him to surrender. However, the number two master has finished setting up the Thunder Machine, and he releases his spiritual energy to summon intense clouds and turns into an oversized Pikachu, releasing powerful thunderbolts that destroy the demons. The giant demon tries to stop him, but Zhuo and his team erect a barrier around the master and protect him until he defeats all the demons. As everyone starts to think that they have won, the portal suddenly grows in size, and a giant cylindrical rock falls from it. It is easily the size of my giant cylindrical rock, but master number two is determined to stop it from hitting the ground. He releases all of his energy as he apprehends the rock, and despite being forced to his knees, he manages to hold it up. The demon emperor is amused at his show of strength, and he starts laughing at the puny human. Then with a gesture of his finger, he creates thousands of portals all over the earth, and similar giant rocks descend from them. The rocks are actually demon spaceships, and demons come flying out of them. Upon seeing this from space, Sun Rong thinks that the earth is doomed, but Wang tells her that there is still hope. He goes to the elevator and picks up the mirror placed inside it. Sun Rong asks him what he plans to do, and he tells her that the dimensional prison they are in is like a game, and he is going to overload the graphics card to crash it. And the best way to do this is by using mirrors. He places two mirrors facing each other and then stands between them. As Wang releases his spiritual energy and starts glowing, an infinite number of reflections start breaking apart the prison. He then asks Sun Rong to use her sword spirit to add to the load of the prison, and she does that. The dimensional prison starts glitching and lagging, and the dimensional lamps in the demon realm suddenly go into turbo mode. They start burning too strong and too fast, and the counselor is not able to keep them under control. Moments later, all the lamps suddenly burst in an instant, and the dimensional prison surrounding the International Space Station vanishes. Wang and Sun Rong are back in their two bodies again. Wang asks her to stay here as he saves the world, but Sun Rong is worried that his identity will be revealed if he does that. He doesn't care about it anymore and speeds to the Earth at hypersonic speeds. On Earth, the demons are causing panic and destruction and even Zhu has lost all hope. Suddenly, one demonic spaceship explodes and falls to the ground, and Zhu realizes that the hero is here to save the day. Wang stands on top of the collapsed spaceship, radiating a golden aura. He is about to take action when, suddenly, Lin appears next to him, sporting beautiful butterfly wings. He is shocked to see her, and she whispers something to him before teleporting him away. She takes him to a train traveling through the multiverse and tells him her backstory. Many years ago, when Lin was just a kid, her dad was teaching her a magic special to their species. In their mystic and ethereal homeland, Lin tried to gather her spiritual energy and use it like her father directed, but she could not do it. She was a child of the butterfly race, but she had not yet manifested her wings. Lin was sad that she might not be able to sprout her wings in the future too, but her dad told her that she is just a late bloomer. He told her that the wings of butterfly people have a special ability that allows them to travel to any dimension freely, and that is why many alien races try to capture them. He wanted his daughter to learn to use her powers as well, because lately demons have been showing aggression towards them. That was all he had to say, and suddenly, a crack opened up in the sky, from which demonic spaceships dropped. Lin's dad knew what was happening, and in the last-ditch effort, he created a portal and yeeted his daughter across the dimensions, asking her to stay safe. The portal closed as Lin cried while watching her dad get attacked by demons. That is how she ended up on Earth, and was found by the sword spirit, who raised her. Now Lin tells Wang that it was the day the Butterfly Clan was destroyed by the Demon Emperor's army. She claims that it is routine for the demons to invade other worlds and destroy those with less power than them, and absorb their spiritual energy. Wang asks her why the Butterfly Clan did not fight back, and Lin mocks him for the stupid question. She replies that the demon race has become too powerful, and the Demon Emperor has conquered thousands of words without moving from his throne. She claims that Earth will meet the same fate soon and tells Wan that he will understand how futile it is to resist the Demon Emperor when he meets him in person soon. Meanwhile, everyone on Earth is on the verge of losing hope when suddenly, they get a livestream notification. It is Sun Rong with the staff of the International Space Station. She tells everyone that even though the odds are overwhelming against them, they are all cultivators. She urges everyone to use the spiritual energy they have cultivated for so long to defend their planet from the demon invasion. Sun Rong's speech moves everyone, and all people on Earth rise up against the demons. The demon emperor hears her speech too, and he applauds her, calling her a worthy heir of the legendary hero. However, he commands his soldiers to destroy her first to crush the hopes of all humans. Suddenly, Lin and Wang teleport to the demon emperor's throne room, and she bows before him. 
She states that she brought Wang to him as per his instructions, and now he should keep his promise and free his sword spirit's sister. The counselor uses his power to bring her to her knees, saying that no weak being deserves to stand in front of the demon emperor. However, he gets frustrated when his trick does not work on Wang, who just flicks his hand and sends him crashing into a wall. The demon emperor laughs at this and gets up, remarking that nothing has made him get his lazy ass up from his throne for the past thousand years, but Wang is too interesting to let go. As he walks towards him, Lin shudders from fear and starts backing away. The demon emperor descends the stairs and Wang asks him if the war will end if he just kills him. The demon emperor leaps in front of him and hits him with a powerful attack, but Wang simply blocks it with one hand, shocking him. Back at Earth, the space station is being attacked from all sides and Sun Rong sees no hope of winning. Suddenly, the demon spaceships around them explode one by one as Jink passes through them. He makes his way to Sun Rong and she remembers everything as she holds him. She asks him if Wang is in any kind of danger and Jink remarks that his master is not in danger. He is the danger. In the demon realm, Wang hits the demon emperor with enough force to cast him out of his castle. The demon emperor can't believe that the human realm had such a strong cultivator and wonders how he never knew of him. Wang simply replies that he always hid his true powers or the earth would be destroyed, but this is not his planet so he doesn't plan to hold back. The demon emperor starts fleeing and Wang chases him, but that was just the demon's plan to lure him. He uses his overwhelming speed to attack Wang, sending him crashing into a spaceship. He hits Wang with multiple combos before charging at him head-on and dragging him around his plan a few times before they come to a stop. Wang has the demon emperor by his tusks and can't believe it. Wang then swings him around and yeets him back to his castle, where Lin has rescued her spirit sister. Wang comes there soon enough and the demon emperor is now terrified of him. He asks him how such a strong cultivator can be found on a weak planet like Earth, and Wang simply tells him that humans are a people that never give up in the face of tragedy, and even without him, they would never submit to the demons. He is about to finish the demon emperor when suddenly, the counselor appears behind him for a sneak attack. He had seen Wang's dad change the amulet on his neck every week, and thinking it was his weak point, he forcibly removed it. That was a mistake he will regret for all the few seconds that are left of his life because Wang's suppressed spiritual energy begins to overflow as the amulet is removed. The castle shakes as he is enveloped in a golden spiritual energy so intense that it destroys the demon planet just by being released. The effects of this release power are too great and cause severe cracks in space. Wang's radiance permeates through the cracks and instantly kills the demons flying in the skies of Earth. The demons turn to dust and fade away and soon the sky turns to normal as the demon spaceships fade away too. Everyone celebrates their victory, and it starts raining. The rain heals everyone's injuries and as Gu tastes it, he finds that it is not water but liquefied spiritual energy. The average spiritual energy value of the earth starts increasing as the energy from the destroyed demon realm starts seeping in. Lin teleports back to earth with her spirit sister, just before Wang teleports back too. She thinks that he will kill her because she betrayed him and found out his secret, but she asks him to at least let her spirit sister go. Wang tells her to stop saying nonsense, take his phone out of his pocket and call his dad to bring an amulet to him immediately. She obeys and helps seal Wang's power, saving the earth from being destroyed. Soon after that, Zhu gets credit for defeating the demon army and becoming the global hero. Sun Rong leads her company back to prosperity while everyone starts working hard to restore the damages caused by the war with the demons and everything returns to normal soon. As Wang and his friends are riding the train one day, Gu and Chen debate about the reasons the demon army ran away. They wonder who the mysterious hero was who destroyed their spaceships, but the picture is too bright to tell anything clearly. They believe that he must be the number one cultivator in the world and start horsing around. Sun Rong looks at the idiots and then asks Wang what exactly happened that day. However, he is sleeping without a care because he finally has a moment to catch a break in his life that doesn't cease to be extraordinary. If you like this video, you would love to watch this loser returns out to be the strongest exorcist from another world.